Hey guys, here's part 2 of October's compilation video. I hope you enjoy it. I want to say thanks to my patrons for helping and supporting my channel. So a big thanks to Courtney Maxwell, Alex, Monica Levelace, Elena Renee, Gemma Allen, James Gargano, Jill Hutchins, Kathleen Fenton, Sarah P, Jody, and Shan. And now for the stories. A little backstory. So I was a security guard for this local company in my area. I was assigned to a water park with another guard who was regularly there to keep watch. He was to train me and show me around and tell me what codes open what doors. I first noticed how quick he was to enter and leave the property. He never wanted to spend more than 10 minutes inside the property before he would be eager to leave. Our first night was simple. There was nothing exciting or interesting going on, so our night dragged. After a few hours, I asked him if he'd experienced anything unusual while working here. He told me he's had some problems with people trying to enter the property without permission, but that's about it. He also told me he hated working there because of his encounters with these people. He said they creeped him out because of how sneaky they were. He didn't really want to tell me much because he was afraid I would leave the post. That should have been a red flag for me, but I was excited to let anything like that scare me. A few more hours later and our shift is over, so we clock out and go home for the day. The next night, my boss calls me to explain that the security guard, my partner, had resigned. I was a little upset because now I had to work a two-man post all by myself, with barely any knowledge on the place. Fast forward a few weeks. I started to get the hang of the place and created my own routine with no issues at all. No break-ins, no vandalism, nothing. It's now 2am and I was outside at the front of the property completing my rounds when I heard a door slam from inside. I jumped because of how loud it was. As I started to walk back into the property, I continued to hear doors opening and closing. I could feel myself getting nervous because it was my first situation I've ever had at this place. As I walk inside and start to check the doors and complete a round to make sure there was no one on the property, I get to this corridor where there was a set of stairs that lead down to a door that was wide open. I walk down the stairs to close and lock the door because I was too scared to take a look inside. As I turned around to head back up the stairs, I noticed a man dressed in all black, standing at the top of the stairs. I take a step back and realize I'm cornered if he was going to try anything, and I would have nowhere to run or hide. So I politely asked him if he needed any help. He didn't reply. I then asked him how he got into the property. He still didn't reply. He slowly turned his head and snapped his fingers. Then, from the left side of the staircase, another man slowly crawled to his side like a dog on all fours. I then turned around and kicked the door open and ran inside. I locked myself in a bathroom as I called my boss and told them what I witnessed. They sent an armed security guard to my position to complete a walkthrough to make sure I was safe. As I got the call that the area was clear, I came out and told them everything from start to finish. I realized that they didn't believe me. So I clocked out and went home for the night. The next morning, I received a call from my boss, explaining that they checked the security footage from the night before, and what they told me horrified me. Every hour when I would complete my rounds from the inside of the property, those same two men would follow me through the facility, as if they were stalking me as if I was game to them. After that, I asked for a new position because I was too horrified to work at the water park. I now know why my trainer didn't want to work there anymore.
I grew up on an island in Alaska, and I lived on the same property since birth to high school graduation. Our house was two stories, and the downstairs had a bathroom, furnace room, storage room, entryway, and rec room. One of the walls had some plywood pieces up, so we could feed extension cords through it to our crawl space. We had a C-shaped driveway that you would enter from one side and then park in the carport, and then drive forward to exit. The crawl space consisted of two big water tanks because we caught our own rainwater. We also used this area for storage. The space was 10 by 15, but only 3 foot high. You had to lift a cover up to get into the water tanks. You could only enter the crawl space from the side of the house. It was a 2 by 2 door that we kept on a master lock but never actually locked it. Our dog, Brewster's area, was on the side of the house as well. He had a big fenced area, his own stairway and porch, which was half covered, and he had a dog house. Brewster was a Weimarana chocolate lab mix who weighed 130 pounds. He was a fantastic dog who only barked when necessary. During the summer, we had black bears in our yard most nights and Brewster would give a quick bark to get them on their way. We knew his barks. There are four of us in my family, my parents, myself, and my older brother, who is two years older and has Down syndrome. My brother was in special education at school, and there were other kids who would come into the same room, but just once in a while throughout the day, because they had a similar disability, and were able to keep up in some of the general classes but some of the kids had discipline problems or mental illness. My brother was loved by the kids in the school, and everyone knew him. One day, a kid that was about 15 came to our door and wanted to play with Travis. We thought it was odd, because Travis has moderate Down syndrome, and he really didn't like playing with other kids. He liked watching kids play. Travis likes watching movies and listening to music. My mom asked the kid what his name was, and he said his name was Mark, and he knew Travis from junior high the year prior, because he would go into Travis's class sometimes for help with his schoolwork. I remember him staring at me a little too much, and he didn't seem like someone who was mentally challenged. My mom let him come in, but kept a watchful eye on them. Travis seemed like he didn't want him there, and my mom told Mark we were having dinner soon, and told him it was time for him to go. My mom found out he moved into the area we lived, but it was still a little ways away. He had been in and out of foster care most of his life. His parents were abusive addicts. I think he came over another time and my mom felt bad for him, but she felt something was off. She felt like he was coming over because of me. My mom politely told him that Travis really didn't like having visitors and he seemed okay with that and never came over again. My parents went to a church service on Wednesday evenings and would be gone for a couple of hours. I would stay at home with Travis. At the time, I was 11 and he was 13. I started helping out in the church nursery when I was 9, and when I turned 11, my best friends and I took a babysitting course, which included CPR and first aid. We would babysit together and at age 12, started babysitting on our own. My mom was a homemaker and was always home, except for Wednesday church service. My parents didn't drink, do drugs, or smoke. I can only remember my parents going out a few times where we needed a babysitter. I would leave the downstairs door unlocked for my parents when they were only going to be gone for a couple of hours. I was expecting them home in a half hour and was surprised when I heard the downstairs door open, and I thought I must not have heard the car pull up, and Travis was up past his bedtime, so I quietly tell Travis to go to his bedroom and get into bed. I start walking through the kitchen to the top of the stairs, and I call out, Mom? Dad? I hear the footsteps stop, and I'm looking down the stairs, and I can see men's work boots and jeans. This isn't my parents. The way the stairs were set up, you could only see the bottom half of someone without descending the stairs. I am scared to death, and I run to Travis who is going down the hall, and I grab him and drag him to my parents' bedroom because it's the only room that locks, has a phone and rifles. 
Down's kids are very stubborn, so my brother just wants to go to his room, but I get him to sit down on the bed. I am trying to keep him in the room while I'm grabbing a gun and trying to call my neighbor. I can hear him walking around downstairs still. My neighbor answers her phone immediately and I whisper, someone is in my house, I'm scared. She told me to come out onto the front porch and she'd be there. I get the courage to run to the door and get outside. Thankfully, she is in our driveway and has her dog with her. She lets me know that she's going to enter the house through the downstairs. She disappears from the right side, but comes back quickly and tells me that the door's locked, so she makes her way up the stairs. She gets to the top when we hear the downstairs door open and then the crunching of gravel as the intruder is running off. She lets go of her dog's leash and the dog chased the person into the woods. The dog came back ten minutes later and our neighbor sat with us until my parents got home. The police were never called because I think my parents assumed it was a neighbor boy screwing with me. We lived in a safe place where you just had to worry about bears and the occasional wolf. A week after this incident, our dog would bark fifteen minutes after we went to bed, every night. We would look out the windows and never saw anything. We figured it was bears because it was springtime and Brewster was probably just getting used to them again. A couple months the barking still happened. I had my best friend stay the night and we would always stay downstairs so we could be louder and stay up as late as we like. Kate had a brother that was seven years older and we'd asked if he'd bring us some booze. I know we were young but that was a normal thing for our town. Kids started drinking, smoking, and having sex in middle school because of the boredom, I think. We got 13 feet of rain a year, so we would be inside a lot. It was a little after midnight, and her brother never showed up, and Brewster never barked that night either. We were sitting on the stairs braiding each other's hair, and we both got a feeling that someone was looking at us. We looked over at the window, and the guy was staring through at us. We ran up the stairs in a panic. We thought maybe it was a brother, but he wouldn't have come to the window and spy on us. But we had the lights on downstairs, and there were no lights by the window outside, so it was hard to tell who it was. We didn't wake my parents up, just in case it was her brother. We waited 30 minutes and went back downstairs to grab our stuff, and then went to sleep in my bedroom for the night. The next day, we talked to her brother, and it wasn't him. That night, Brewster was back to barking again. Two more months go by, and I had gone to bed and heard Brewster bark. I looked out my window as usual and didn't see anything. I had just dozed back off, and I woke up to Brewster barking frantically. I look out of my window, and I see a guy running out of the driveway. I thought about waking my parents, but we had a trail on the side of our house that kids used to get to the road behind us. The neighborhood was on the side of a mountain, so the kids used the trails to go straight to another road instead of using the main roads. I had never seen someone come out of the other part of the driveway because the trail was on the south side of the house along with the crawl space and Brewster's area. My room was the only room on the north side. I decided to go back to sleep and I was tossing and turning. Fifteen minutes go by and I smell smoke. I go to the hall and the smoke is a lot stronger and it's starting to get hazy in Travis's room which was directly across from mine. I scream, fire, fire, wake up. My parents are up and Travis doesn't want to get out of bed but thank God for the strength of adrenaline. We get outside and the flames are pouring out of the crawl space. We get Brewster out of his enclosure and the neighbors all come out to help us. The firemen were there rather quickly, but the fire had destroyed the crawl space and my parents and Travis's bedrooms because they were directly over the crawl space. The firemen got the fire out thankfully and nobody was physically hurt. This was one of the scariest nights of my life though. I will always remember the fire chief kneeling down to speak to me after he had talked to my parents and said, Melinda, we believe it was arson. 
I looked at him with tears streaming down my face, and I say in anger, Who is Arson? Everyone started laughing so hard, and I'm thinking, how is this funny? That damn Arson could have killed my family. So he explained what Arson was. I am still friends with the old fire chief's son, and I share that story with him often, because his father passed away from cancer when we were teens. His father is the only happy memory I have from that horrific night. The island I grew up on had a city and a village out south. We lived out south, but before the village. We had firemen far out south, north, and the city. We had state troopers for the island and city cops in the city limits. My mom took my brother and I to our family friend's house, and my dad dealt with the fire officials and a state trooper showed up later. After the investigation, my family, neighbors, and firemen pieced together that a person had been living in our crawl space for at least four months. We know he set the house on fire on purpose. He used a box of matches. My mom said the first odd thing she noticed that night was the smell of sulfur. We also know who did it. It was Mark. His uncle was one of the firemen who first showed up at our house and saw him standing near our driveway, watching. My mom had told him my description of what the person was wearing that I saw fleeing from our house, and it was what he was wearing. Behind our house, near the crawlspace area, my dad found where he hung out when he wasn't in the crawlspace. There were a bunch of cigarette butts, cans of soda, which were also found in the crawlspace. But because our crawlspace wasn't locked, our insurance company wouldn't have paid for the repairs. Because of our water tanks, that space was supposed to be locked. So my parents never said anything to the police, and the firemen never said anything. By pursuing this, we could have not had a home, a house my father had built. It took four months for a house to be repaired, and it smelled like ozone even years later. What bothers me the most is knowing he had seen me and my friends undress numerous times while changing in the rec room during tons of sleepovers. Where he had set up shop was right next to the plywood with the holes drilled through. He listened to all of our secrets. I never explained to my friends that he had seen us and heard us during our sleepovers because I didn't want them to feel sick to their stomachs like I did, and still do. I still have issues when it comes to being home alone. I can't sleep if I'm the only adult in the house. I keep the volume on everything very low. I am scared to shower. I like to be able to see the front door, and I have night terrors to this day. I am 34 now. I have been dealing with anxiety since the fire and panic attacks since I was 18. Just recently, I was diagnosed with PTSD. When the intruder was in his early 20s, he was caught for burning down a few houses and was put in jail. All my childhood toys were stored in that crawl space, along with a lot of our family's sentimental possessions. This happened in 2008. When I was nine years old, I lived in a townhome community where each road had two sides of homes. In between the backs of the houses, there was a back road with alleyways that went in between each building section. I lived on the edge of one of these and my townhome was on one of the alleyways. I lived on one street and across the back road on the opposite side lived an elderly woman whose name I don't even know. I am not sure what her situation was, but for whatever reason, she never liked me specifically. She was creepy and spray painted all of her windows so no one could see inside of her house. However, that never stopped her from sometimes staring out of her bedroom window directly at mine and keeping it open at night to shine a red strobe light into my room across the way. She used to yell how she hated us. I was in fourth grade, and on a particular January morning, I had unfortunately missed the bus. My dad sent me outside to get in the car, 
so he could drive me, and he said he'd follow me out soon after. As I was walking to my dad's car, she came out of the alleyway next to my house, slowly, with a gigantic kitchen knife behind her back. She raised it and started running after me. I was faster than her, so I was able to avoid her, and I was able to get into the house. She walked and stood on the neighbor's porch across the way and stared at my house. I was terrified. My dad ran out and yelled at her, and she said she wanted to get rid of us stupid kids. My parents called the police, but the police sent her home and had an ambulance pick her up later. My parents went to some kind of court meeting about it, but I don't really know the details. I didn't see her again after that, until one year later. I don't remember the day, but it had snowed that morning, so I was going to run out the front door and play in the snow. I opened the door to see her standing on the porch, but looking out towards the road. I panicked, closed the door, and locked it. I ran up to my parents' room and told them what happened, and we saw her walk off the porch and up the street. I never saw her again after that. My family has since moved far away from there, but people I know say she still lives there, and her windows are still the same spray-painted windows. Though it doesn't affect me as much as it used to, I still don't like being around knives. The story takes place at a mall, where the establishment just built a cute rubber playground. At the time, I was six years old, and was simply enjoying playing at the area as my family was shopping only a few feet away. Then came a wrinkly-looking tan man with a long beard. Skinny and balding, he approached a small Latino boy and began talking to him about cool toys he had in his van. Now at this time, I knew what stranger danger meant, but to my shame, I only stood there, shocked that this was happening. More so, when this boy was agreeing to follow him where he kept the toys. I remember thinking, oh my god, is that boy really going with this man? Doesn't he know what stranger danger is? If that didn't make things worse, the boy was so excited that he went ahead to invite his brother around the same age as I am, and they went off together. I honestly didn't know what I could do, run off into this giant mall after them and get lost? Tell my mom what was going on. Would she even believe me? Where were their parents? But as I stood there, watching them walk off together in the distance, so did the opportunity. I stopped playing and walked into the store where my mom was, and told her in a shy voice what happened. I was struggling to find the words, but I told her along the lines of, Hey, Mommy, I saw something strange happen. I saw an ugly guy walk off with two boys, like the kind of men you warned me about on the news. She looked at me and smiled, not seeming to entirely understand. I pressed the issue more so, but she only responded, don't worry, mommy is almost done shopping for shoes. She proceeded to shower me with compliments, in the kind of tone moms reserve for when they playfully talk to babies. But this only made me more distressed. I could feel the time to act slipping away. I remember telling her, I'm serious, there was a creepy man over there talking to children. I pointed at the direction where they once stood. I remember watching her face attentively saw a flicker of understanding, but she brushed it off as doubt settled in. That was the end of that encounter. A few days later, I was watching the news with my mom, and I saw the same boys. I felt placed on the spotlight again on what to do, but I knew my mom would never take me seriously. I was only six, and my families were illegals who wouldn't want to involve themselves with the police anyway. I asked my mom what she thought about those two boys, but she had no opinion because she wasn't paying attention to the TV anyway. 
I often look back with regret of what I could have done. Parents may teach their kids of what to do when these incidents happen to them, but I don't know what I could do as a witness. I felt as if I had done what I could do by telling my mom, but I was too young in her eyes to be taken seriously. Screw that playground. I never ended up playing there after that incident. I'm 21 now, but I still see parents dropping off their kids there and then shopping around the area. What a dumb place to have anyway, as it only encourages such negligence. Often, I enjoy walking my dog at night time. This is due to the fact that my dog is harder to walk when people are around with their own dogs. So, we tend to walk around parks in the area when they've become somewhat secluded. I'm not a very big guy. I'm just about 5 foot 10 and very lanky, so I wouldn't call myself an intimidating figure. However, my 120 pound black boxer lab mix named Loki could be somewhat considered threatening to most from what I hear. I figured his size would be used as a deterrent for anyone looking to cause nightly troubles. I was dead wrong. On one specific night in the fall of 2016, I can recall of an encounter that reminds me of why I am so reluctant to walk around once daylight falls. This specific park is one I have been to a couple of times, and from what I remember, this park is usually secluded around 6.30 and later. Aside from a couple of joggers or very few other dog walkers, not many people walk the same path I take. I also like to put on my headphones and listen to music while I walk, but on this specific night, I chose not to wear them since my phone was on low battery and I wanted to preserve it as long as I could. Anyway, the walk was going as usual. Loki did his business and we continued on a usual path. About midway on our walk, I realized that it had started to get really dark. Since he was done with his business, I had decided to cut the walk somewhat short, and we took a shortcut that kind of led us off the path. This path had a bunch of trees surrounding the area, and there were still leaves on the branches. With that being said, I felt kind of weird, as if I were being watched. I have pretty bad anxiety sometimes, but since I knew the town was safe, I knew that nothing was going to happen. But still, I could not for the life of me shake off the feeling I was being watched. I peered back to see if anyone had been following me out of anxiety, and every single time, no one was there. In fact, no one was anywhere. This whole shortcut was essentially secluded. Suddenly. Loki stopped walking and looked back. I told him, Loki, come on boy, we've got to go. One thing I failed to mention was that Loki is a big coward. I noticed his tail was tucked between his legs, which is a telltale sign that a dog is afraid. I was also curious and a bit nervous, but I surely didn't want to find out what he had noticed. I just wanted to get out ASAP. I pulled a little and he began to walk, but every now and then I'd see him peer back. After maybe a minute or so of walking, he stopped again, and this time he began to growl. Despite being a coward, Loki is a bark but no bite kind of dog, so I took this chance to see exactly what he was growling at. It was quite dark, so I couldn't see that well. I decided to use my phone's flashlight to see what was up. Trees, just trees. What he heard was probably some kind of small animal. Once again, I turned around and kept walking. He continued to peer back once in a while still, but this time, I noticed it was a lot more frequent. I just said to myself, just squirrels, maybe a bird, and I ignored it. Then, I heard what appeared to be actual footsteps and branches breaking. There is absolutely no way a small animal could have produced a sound like that. Loki turned around quick, and still with his tail tucked, he began to growl and bark at a figure that I could only describe as a man in his early fifties. 
possibly late forties, that appeared from out of the woods. He was dressed in dirty clothing. His hair was long and graying. He had one hand in his pocket and said to me, Nice dog you have there, kid. What breed is he? He's a boxer lab mix, I replied. Oh, I love dogs. Mind if I pet him? He wondered. The man got closer and emerged from the trees. As he came closer, I realized that he was quite tall and a bit burly. Loki instantly got bad vibes. He ran behind me and started to bark at him. Actually, I kind of do mind. My dog here doesn't like strangers. Sorry, but it's probably not best if you pet him, I quickly stated. It's okay, really. He seems like a friendly guy. Just a little pet wouldn't harm him, the man retorted as he got closer. I felt extremely uncomfortable as he appeared to get closer and closer. I don't know why this guy couldn't take no for an answer. I mean, I usually don't allow people to pet Loki unless he comes up to them first. If he's scared of you, then I usually don't want him to freak out by letting him be pet by a stranger. This is especially the case when said stranger came from the woods behind a few trees. I'm really sorry, man. I'm scared he'd bite you or something. I told him as I began to walk away. Like I said before, I wasn't trying to be judgmental or anything, but the guy came from the woods and was possibly the one tailing us from before. I don't know why you won't just let me introduce myself to him, the guy replied angrily. This time, I began to speed walk. I was very uncomfortable and my fight or flight instincts began to take over. He followed us and kept muttering curses to himself. I don't know if this man was under the influence or something, but he did not let up. I won't lie, I started to get a little angry. Why can't a guy just take no for an answer? He began to match my speed, almost as if he was trying to catch up to us. Loki and I both took this as an answer to start sprinting. I don't remember much of the running, it was all a blur to me, but I do remember the spine-tingling feeling of hearing his footsteps rapidly increasing from behind me. For a man of his stature, he was quite fast. I also realized that his intentions may not have just been to pet my dog. No one reasonable enough would go that far just to pet a dog that clearly wanted nothing to do with him. I looked behind me and he was in pursuit, maybe about 10 feet behind me. He was chasing us. I'll never forget the look in his eyes. I've never had anyone look at me like that. It was a look of killer intent. All for what? Just because he couldn't pet my dog? My instincts told me that he definitely had sinister intent behind that. Finally, the path led to the park exit and into the busier streets. I lived about 10 minutes away from the park. I made sure no one was following me, and I even made sure to walk on the populated streets. After what seemed like an eternity, we got home, but I knew for a fact I wasn't going to get a minute of sleep. From my window in the porch, I watched all night with Loki just to see if anyone followed us home. I also made a police report with my parents. After all, this guy seemed to have been quite suspicious, and who knows what his true intentions were. Had his target been someone who couldn't protect themselves or run away, what would he have done? I also often ask myself, what if I had worn my headphones and the sound of the music drowned out the footsteps behind me? I live in Florida, and this incident happened about three weeks after Hurricane Irma. Back in July, the ex and I had just finalized the divorce, and I had moved into a gated neighborhood where every house was rented out by the same rental company. It's a very small neighborhood with about 15 houses tops. All 15 houses are bordered around a man-made lake with the backyards facing the lake. No one really has a fenced backyard per se. When you walk out the back door, 
You see the lake in front of you and each of the neighbors' backyards on each side of yours. Everyone in the neighborhood seemed very close. Someone was always hosting a family-friendly barbecue or having people over to watch sports. I was and still am depressed about my divorce, so I never partook in these social gatherings. The only person I got to know was my next-door neighbor, Steve, an active Navy soldier with a huge love for guns. Steve is the hero in this nightmare. My daughter Alice is four years old and I get her every weekend. Alice's bedroom window faces the backyard towards the lake. I spoil that girl to death. She truly is my everything, and I count down the days to the weekend every week just to be with her. The weekend before the storm, she was with her mom. Then obviously the weekend of the storm, she was with her mom. Then on top of that, the weekend after, she had to be with her mom because my power was still out. The humidity was so bad in that week, I had to sleep in my daughter's room the whole time because her room is the only one with a window that faced the lake. I opened the window, exposing just the window screen so the wind from the lake could cool the room down as much as possible while I slept. Eventually, the power comes back and Alice starts visiting me again like normal. That was when the nightmare started. My daughter would complain about the singing lady and how she doesn't like her anymore. I thought maybe she was referring to one of my ex's friends or one of the teachers at her school. Maybe there was a teacher at her school that sang to the kids that she didn't like. That Saturday night, Alice woke up in the middle of the night screaming bloody murder. I ran into her room and turned on the light and I found her hiding under her covers. I asked her what was wrong, and all she could do was point to an empty corner of her room and say, Look, look. There was nothing there. She was acting as if she saw a ghost. After I calmed her down, she started talking about the singing lady again. Please tell the singing lady not to come back. Please, daddy, make her go away. Obviously, she's having nightmares, right? I showed her that there was nothing in the closet, and nothing under the bed, and that there was nothing to be afraid of. She calmed down and went back to sleep. I went back to my room and quickly fell asleep again. It couldn't have been more than 20 minutes before Alex comes running into my room screaming, She's back. She's back. Alice absolutely refused to go back to her room, so I let her sleep with me. The next morning, Sunday morning, I took Alice out to breakfast and we stopped by Target to pick up a baby monitor. I haven't used one since her mom and I were still married, but I wanted to easily be able to hear her if and when she started having these nightmares again so I could respond quicker. After I set them up, I showed Alice how they worked to give her assurance that I could hear her and that she was safe. That night she slept soundly and didn't make a peep all night. The following weekend, Alice had to stay with her mom again because she caught a stomach virus from one of her little friends at school. It was Saturday night and I was sound asleep in my bed. Around 2am is when I heard it. A woman's voice humming a soft nursery rhyme through the baby monitor. The humming got louder and clearer as the voice got closer to the monitor. I wasn't dreaming. I could hear a woman softly singing lullabies in my daughter's bedroom. I have never been so scared and dumbfounded in my life. I was feeling a mixture of pure terror and disbelief. Then the voice spoke out. Alice, sweetie, are you awake? Adrenaline shot through my veins. I jumped out of my bed and locked my bedroom door. I picked up my cell phone and called my neighbor Steve. He didn't waste a second. As soon as I got off the phone with them, I heard him storm out his back door, screaming, Don't you fucking move. I ran outside and found him aiming a shotgun at a woman, crouched outside my daughter's window, the one I had left open after Irma and never closed. Steve quickly dropped his guard when he recognized the woman. It was Jean, the neighborhood maintenance woman. Steve's wife came running out after him and confirmed it was her. Jean played dumb 
She said she was not singing and didn't even know my daughter's name. She said she was near my daughter's window because she was doing her weekly patrol for gators and thought she saw one approach our house from the lake. Bullshit. She was singing and she called out to my daughter by name. Yes, it's true, there have been a few gator spottings around the neighborhood. And yes, part of Jean's job was to patrol the lake at night every now and then. But at 2 a.m., I obviously knew this was bullshit. And even though neither Steve or his wife called her out on it, I could tell from the look on their faces that they didn't believe her either. The next morning, I went over to Steve's house to thank him and tell him exactly what happened. He told me Jean and her husband have been known to be a little cuckoo but this is by far the craziest thing to happen so far. Steve helped me install metal bars on Alice's window that afternoon. I live in an apartment building that has four apartments on each floor. The apartments are split into two groups by something we call a bubble. Basically two apartments share this bubble, and there is a metal door guarding them before each tenant goes into their own doors. My husband works as a doctor, so he had to go to work for his night shift. I usually do house chores when he's gone to work, so the house is clean when he comes back in the morning. I turn on the Scary Stories podcast on my Xbox and do my work. I have two cats, Zena, who is five years old, and Marcel, who is three months old. They are usually very playful during nighttime. At one point, they stop from chasing each other and proceed to stare at the door without moving or blinking. Zena, my eldest, having her back curled and silently hissing under the door, she never expresses such behavior. She is the most chillest and laid-back cat there is so having a react like this made me very curious. At the same time, one of the stories that I was listening to was about home invaders. Also, from the local news, we have been informed how most of the times said invaders will check on houses they want to break into and learn the owner's schedules and such before trying to break into their homes. This made me feel very insecure, and I turned the volume lower in order to hear what was going on on the outside of my door. Which, by the way, it is impossible to get to unless you unlock the first metal door. Which has the sole purpose for extra protection for my and my neighbor's apartment. My neighbor is a lonely old lady that has two cats of her own. And is, ironically, the building manager. It must have been around midnight, and she was most likely sound asleep by then. I turn the volume to my TV down and go closer to the door. Having Zena still not move from her position, pressing my ear against the door, searching for sounds. I couldn't hear much, except a distinguished sound of heavy breathing, like an alcoholic breathing heavily. It gave me goosebumps, and I immediately started looking around the house for something to defend myself with. In a worst case scenario, thinking that if he broke past the metal door all by himself, then my apartment door wouldn't be a challenge for him. I took my husband's baseball bat and held onto it with my life. I took my cats and hid them in the cupboard underneath the sink, and then I went back to the door. I opened the peephole to look at the person breathing through my door at midnight, and my heart sunk to my stomach. All I could see was an eye, a very veiny, red, and popped out eye, staring back at me, right into my soul followed by repeated and faster breathing, as if it knew I was watching back. I didn't move or make a sound, hoping that it would make the creep go away. But that was not the case. Even when I moved back from the door, I see the doorknob moving frantically. He was trying to get inside, murmuring something I couldn't make out, as if on a frenzy. I freeze, holding the baseball bat to my shoulder level, basically preparing myself to bash out this guy's head if he managed to get inside. As he was trying desperately to get inside, fighting with both the doorknob and the keyhole because I could hear noises coming from the keyhole, an idea came to mind. 
I rush to the living room, which is very close to the entrance door, and blast out the scary podcast. Luckily, the specific story was narrated by a man with a very heavy voice, and from the outside, it almost sounded like the man was someone inside the apartment having a conversation. Mostly a monologue. I live in a country where English is not a native language, and few people speak it. At last, what I prayed would work actually did. The moment I blasted the volume to max, the doorknob stopped moving. The breathing ceased, and as I went back to the door and checked the peephole for that creepy man, he was no longer there, but the metal door outside was wide open. Of course, my neighbor only now wakes up to find my podcast basically screaming in my house, asking me to turn it down. I tell her what happened and how she hasn't heard anything. She said she had her TV on as well, as she sleeps with it on, so that way she doesn't feel alone and didn't hear the conundrum going on in the hallway between our apartments. We both examined the metal door, asking each other if we left it open. I even called my husband at work to ask him the same thing, and he told me he had locked it twice, as usual. I don't know what I would have done if this expert in door breaking actually managed to break into my house but I do think it would have been for the worst for me and my cats. I never thought that, of all the possibilities of salvation, the scary podcast would be what saved my life. Thank you, being scared narrator, for indirectly, of course, saving my life. It started over a year ago, living in my current small neighborhood. It was unusually hot in our house for October, and my sister thought it would be a good idea to keep a window open for a bit of air. She was doing her homework, and I was getting ready for bed, when suddenly she bursts in my room. She frantically says that she heard some noises outside, sounds of leaves crunching under a person's steps. I believed it to be an animal. So I walk into her room and stay there for not more than five minutes, until I hear leaves crunching. We quickly glance out of the window, only to hear the sound of something running away in the woods. But that wouldn't be the end of the story. During the winter, I enjoyed exploring the woods towards the back of my house, climbing trees and traveling further back to the fields. I remember the events very clearly. It had just snowed that night first snowfall of winter, and I was more than excited to head out there. I did so and climbed my usual tree to look out. I gave the cursory glance around me and at the ground when I noticed something strange. Footsteps leading away from my house. This wouldn't be weird as long as the front of the steps didn't end pointing straight at my house and the origin of them came from a seemingly long off start. I tracked them down, up to a point where there was a rusty wire fence covered in snow, where they disappeared. On October 2017, it started up again. I was laying in my bed in the pitch dark, not a light shining through my room when I heard it, my doorknob turning and my door creaking open. My heart stopped. Every single possibility of what it was was rushing through my mind. Since I was covered up by my blanket, I quickly shot my sister a text. Did you just come in my room? She replied with a sharp, No, I'm all the way in Hilliard. My heart began pumping fast. I slowly snuck my hand under my pillow and grabbed my baton and then sent a text to my dad and waited. My dad came in mere minutes later with a knife, shot on the lights, and I jumped out of bed. We searched the entire house with nothing. The alarm was still set and all doors locked. Impossible. There's no way that happened otherwise. My dad and mom were asleep and a cat would have opened it much faster if it jumped at the doorknob. You best believe I didn't sleep a second that night. Fast forward to December. My relatives are in town staying for the week in the basement. We turn on the alarm and all head to sleep. I stayed up gaming. In the morning, Roughly around 2.30 to 3, my uncle slowly opened his eyes with a feeling of being watched. 
His eyes adjusted a bit to the dark before he saw it. A guy, average height, scrawny, hair flowing in the wind and shivering, looking inside their room through the window. My uncle screamed and they grabbed the baby before taking off upstairs. That morning, I was informed to what happened. I looked for footprints and only saw the smallest sign of a footprint, a front toe print made by what I can only assume was a sneaker. My uncle gave me more details without me telling him I looked for footprints, and he said the guy was leaning to the left, looking in. The footprint matched his story. The left had a thin line of dirt anyone could have shimmied across. Now that leads to tonight, the night I could swear he, or whatever it was, had been in our house. I couldn't sleep. Life has been stressful lately, and I was up pretty much all night, until I tried getting rest. Every night I've had a string of Christmas lights dimly light the room, until tonight. I figured the lights must have been interfering with my sleep, so I unplugged them and headed off to sleep. Pillow over my head, I started to drift off until it happened. A quick strum of my guitar and the sound of something falling over with a desperate attempt to stop it from hitting the ground filled the room. The sound ignited my heart rate. Saliva developing at an extreme speed made it hard not to swallow. I could feel the presence of someone in my room. Realizing I'd left my baton on my desk, I did the next logical thing, pretend I was asleep. I tried and laid there for what felt like hours, when in reality it was only a few minutes until I heard a whimper come from my sister's room. Imagining this may be the day that everyone in my family was silently murdered but me, I gathered all the courage I had. I grabbed my phone, turned on the flashlight and grabbed my baton. I busted into my sister's room and screamed hey, only to see that they were unharmed. My sister asked what the hell I was doing and I just stood there looked into the pitch black of my room and cried. I have never in my life felt the overwhelming emotion of believing my family was going to be taken from me until today. All I can come up with is that there is some guy stalking my family and perhaps sneaking into our rooms at night. I was around 10 or 11 years old when this happened. Old enough to stay home alone, but not old enough to recognize some red flags. I attended camp over the summer, the typical 8 to 3 routine. My house sits close to the end of my street, which forms a U, but for some reason the bus driver would never drop me off at my house. I would always get dropped off at the end of my street, where I would toddle myself along back home. Both of my parents worked late hours, sometimes not getting home until 8pm, and it would be very expensive to hire a babysitter for 4-5 to five hours a day, 5 days a week. So, starting 6th grade, when the bus dropped me off at home, I would be by myself. I do the usual middle school routine, play games online and watch TV. Occasionally, my neighbor's cat would come into my backyard and I would feed and pet her as a way to get outside. The only computer in the house was in my dad's workroom, which has a window overlooking the deck and a window overlooking the side of the house. We have large bay windows in the living room, dining room, and kitchen of my house, and since we sit on a hill, you can pretty much see the entire backyard from a nice vantage point. So most days when I got home, I toss off my backpack and go right to that room, and you could see me walk from the front door and pop up by the computer from outside. Unfortunately, this would lead to something that I had forgotten about up until now. When I got off the bus, I did as expected, go into my dad's workroom and play computer games. About 30 minutes into this, I can hear faint meowing coming from outside the window. I pause the game and look outside, thinking maybe my neighbor's cat had wandered over. Nothing. I just sat back down and resumed playing, only to hear the meowing again. It was quiet, but noticeable, and so I checked the other window. Nothing again. This routine happened for a good 10 minutes, and eventually I got frustrated and I went into the living room to watch TV. Not even two minutes later, 
meowing from the window I was sitting right beside. Now I was confused and a little creeped out, so I shut the blinds and kept trying to watch TV. The meows continued, but only when they came from the window right behind me did I jump and leave the living room, officially skeeved. I went into my bedroom, where all the blinds were down, but still cracked for some sunlight. I tried to read a book, only to hear a meow come from outside my bedroom window. This was enough to make me call my dad, concerned that maybe the cat was hurt, but I couldn't see it to be sure. He said he would have the neighbor come and check it out, and then call me back later. Ten minutes go by, and I get a call from my dad saying he was coming home from work. Nothing urgent in his voice, just that his job had gotten cancelled and he was coming home early. I thought nothing of it, and when he got home, I realized that the cat noises had stopped. Fast forward to the present, and I asked my dad about the strange incident, thinking it was funny the cat had followed me around. What he told me next made my blood run cold. After I called him, my neighbor did indeed come to check on the house. What he found were large footprints, leading in circles all around the house, clustered close to the walls so that even if I looked outside, I wouldn't see anything. Someone had been stalking me through my house, seeing where I was through the windows, and making cat noises to try and get me to come outside. They must have known I was home alone, since it was that easy to see me walk down the street by myself, and then let myself in. My neighbor immediately called my dad and searched the property, but found no one. The police weren't called, since there was nothing but footprints that led off into the woods and got lost. And I never saw anyone. My dad stayed home with me for the rest of that week. It sickens me to know that there are people who would use these tactics to try and lure kids out of their homes. I've always been kind of creeped out by the house my mom and I live in, but it's gotten a little out of hand, I think. I've always got that kind of feeling like, oh, someone's in the room with me right now, or someone's looking at me, and I would always check around to find no one there. There are some pages posted around the halls with a bunch of writing on it that I and my mom could never figure out, and that added to the creepiness. My room has two windows, so there's a lot of natural light. I used to have sheer curtains and pretty much keep them open constantly until my parents came home one day and said that they saw someone outside my window watching me. The neighbors are shit and always messing with us, so I always assumed it was them being creepy. But I'm not so sure now. I hate being home alone here. I always hear noises and I can't figure out where they're coming from. There's always scratching in the walls and recently things keep falling around the house. I thought it was maybe paranormal, but I'm even more scared that it's a real person. It just happened again. I'm home alone, and I kept hearing noises around the house. As usual, I kept my door open, lights on in the main house, and had my cat on my bed. I kept getting up to check on what the noises were, and there was nothing there. But then, I heard a really loud crash from the bathroom. I took a curtain rod for safety and went to investigate. I didn't see anything suspicious until I looked up. We have drop tile ceiling in the bathroom for whatever reason, but nowhere else in the house. One of the tiles was completely pulled out of place. I used my handy curtain rod to push it back into place. I then got my cat and a knife for security. I've already texted my mother at this point. I'm sitting on my bed watching the bathroom door waiting for something to happen. It was incredibly scary. It's not really possible for those tiles to support someone's body weight, but something moved it out of place, and there was some loud noise that happened along with it. I don't even know what the explanation could be. It couldn't be the neighbors. There are floorboards between their floor and our ceiling, unless they have some creepy crawl space to our apartment. Plus, I can hear them upstairs. They stomp around and scream at each other like usual. 
Whatever it is, I don't even want to know, but I think I'm going to find out. This happened not too long ago. I really feel like I want to tell people because I'm still scared. My husband works a rotating schedule, so sometimes he works night shifts and other times he works days. Two days ago, he started his night shift rotation. I always feel uneasy at home when he's not here, even though we live in the country and it's supposed to be safer out here. Around 9.30 Friday night, I was doing my dishes my daughter was watching TV and my dogs were sleeping. I had just turned off our sink and I heard the screen door open. It makes a swoosh kind of noise when it opens and closes. We have a little entryway between the screen door and the main door. A couple seconds after I heard the screen door, I saw the main door handle turn all the way down. It has an electronic key lock, so the handle turns even when it's locked. I feel so lucky that I remembered to lock it. Immediately, the dogs started acting weird. They're running around all the windows trying to look out, and they're growling and barking. As much as I didn't want to, I looked out the window and saw nothing. No person, no car, nothing. I picked up my daughter and took her to the bedroom, and then I called 911. It only took a few minutes for the cops to get here because I guess they were just in the area. I told them what happened and they looked around briefly and then said that the wind must have opened the screen door and no one was out there. Whatever. I live in the woods. The person was probably standing a hundred feet away, watching them half-ass their search. I haven't felt safe here since. I've even started locking the screen door. It's not like the house looked empty. All the lights were on and the TV was playing a show. I can't even describe the deep down fear I felt when I saw the door handle turn. I'm glad the dogs are very vocal and scary sounding. I think it deterred the person from trying any harder to get in. So this happened about a year ago when I was a senior in college. It was a football game day, and after the game ended, I went into a bar with my friends for a couple of drinks, and then decided to go home. I was in bed and asleep by 10.30 because it had been a long day. Around 4.30 a.m., I woke up to a dark figure laying in bed with me, leaning over. I was so disoriented that all I had managed to mutter was, What are you doing? and the guy quickly jumped over me and ran out the door, down the stairs, and out the front door. I was in shock and so confused as to what had just happened. I lived with three other girls. Two of them had friends in town, and just happened to lock their doors that night, and the others weren't there. So, what's really scary is that this man walked all around our house, and even came all the way upstairs to find my room. We called the cops and they came over to take our statements. Then, they told us that our neighbor called them 30 minutes before us and reported that she woke up to a dark figure standing in her doorway. We were all so freaked out that five of us slept in one queen bed for the rest of the night. To this day, I am terrified to be home alone. They never found the guy, but I hope I never see him again. So yesterday, I was at my sister's house with my mom, watching my son and nephews play in the yard. One of my nephews, Harrison, was picking bark off a tree when I remembered an odd encounter I had as a kid. I said, so weird, out loud, thinking about the encounter. My mom inquired what I was talking about, so I told her. When I was a kid, I was hanging out at the Pinecone Forest which was what the neighborhood kids called a small patch of trees on the side of the road. I was picking bark off one of the trees to pass some time 
waiting for my friend Frankie to finish his homework and come out to play. Out of nowhere, it seemed, a guy came up to me. I could smell him before I saw him. He smelled like stale cigarette smoke. I was kind of scared when I looked at him. He wasn't very old, but he had a very lazy eye that was cloudy, and his teeth and fingernails were stained yellow. My mom taught me to be nice to people, even if they don't look like me, so I faked a smile and said hello. What are you doing? He asked me. The smell of his breath was the worst. Um, I'm picking the bark off this tree? You shouldn't do that. It's like picking off the tree's skin. How would you feel if someone picked off your skin? He said while lightly pinching my arm with his sharp yellow nails. I don't know. I replied and took my arm back. Just then, Frankie's mom called for me out the door and told me to come in and wait inside. I didn't think anything of the whole situation at the time. When I told my mom about it, she had this look of, I don't know, guilt, maybe. She said that it's probably time I know the whole story. She thought I forgot about the whole encounter, so she never brought it up to me. First, you should know that the neighborhood I grew up in was a small, tight-knit community. Everyone knew everyone, and there was no reason for an outsider to come unless they knew someone there. Anyway, here's what happened with this guy. Frankie's mom, Sonia, noticed the white van with no windows parked on the side of the road. She didn't recognize it, but figured maybe it was a visitor for a neighbor. Sonia said that the van had been there all morning and afternoon. She was kind of keeping an eye on it. She said she just had a bad feeling. Her house had a huge window in front, facing the pinecone forest, and the van was parked next to it. She saw me waiting for Frankie and kept a constant eye on the van, while holding the phone just in case. She saw the man exit the back of the van and walk up to me. As soon as she saw him grab my arm and pinch me, she called the cops, and that was when she called me into her house. The cops stopped the guy just outside of my neighborhood. In the back of his van were binoculars, a Polaroid camera, and pictures of me taped all over the walls and ceiling. Me at school, at my grandparents' house, at the bank with my mom. Just me, everywhere I went. But that's not all. He had a key to a storage unit on him. Inside the unit, they found a cabinet full of knives. A lot of knives. Paring knives, a butcher cleaver, a thin fillet knife, a melon baller, and just various knives of all shapes and sizes. There were also a few anatomy books, duct tape, and ten empty five gallon buckets. In the middle of the unit was an old bed that was used to restrain mental patients, so it had wrist and ankle straps and the entire inside of the unit was covered in plastic. My mom said he was in a high security mental institution for the criminally insane last that she heard. So, that's pretty creepy to me. When I was two, my mother, who was 20 at the time, was already a single parent. My parents had split the year before. At the time, we lived with another student from the nursing program my mother was attending. The roommate, Emily was her name, was very smart. My mom had to study hard for her grades, but Emily was one of those people who could read a passage once and remember it. One Thursday night, Emily was trying to convince my mom to go out drinking with her, but my mom had a bunch of studying to do. Still, she didn't want to spend the night alone in the house, so she decided to go spend the night with my grandparents. The next day, Emily wasn't in class. When mom got home, Emily's car wasn't there, but my mom didn't think too much of it until she found Emily's purse. When mom found it, she knew something was wrong. She decided to call the pharmacy where Emily worked as an assistant, and they told my mom that she hadn't turned up for work yet. 
Mom decided to call her boyfriend at the time, and he came over to have a look around. When he found a broken window in the bathroom, he told my mom to call the police. The police arrived pretty quickly and searched Emily's room. They pulled back the covers on her bed. Her sheets were soaked with blood. That's when mom realized that Emily was dead. The police found her car abandoned out on a country road. Emily's body was found in a field nearby. She had been stabbed to death. Mom was, for good reason, terrified and decided to move back in with my grandparents. Eventually, the police found the man who murdered Emily. As it turned out, he didn't get his intended target that night. No, he'd been watching my mom for some time. He even posed as a potential buyer of the house that mom and Emily were renting and toured it with the real estate agent. In court, he tried to get this crazy letter that was supposed to be from my mom admitted as evidence. Anyway, the man got life in prison and my mom is supposed to be notified whenever he's released. She no longer lives in fear. I can't help but wonder what would have happened to me if she decided to stay home. Would I still be alive? Would I have grown up without a mother? I ache when I think about the terror Emily must have experienced. But at the same time, I'm glad it wasn't us, and I feel guilty about that. This morning, I just got out of class and was headed home. I then saw a cold lady begging for help and telling me that she needed to get into her apartment. I helped her, took an elevator, and took her to the door. To my surprise, the door was wide open. When I went inside, she asked me if I could go to a nearby shop to buy her wine and some cigarettes. She then proceeded to give me her credit card and keys and insist on the fact that I should leave my bag in her house. I said no thank you. Even though the situation was weird, it wasn't that that scared me the most. It was the inside of her apartment. There were no decorations, pictures, or anything. It was disgusting. There was some kind of chair with excrement on it, and the walls were filled with cracks. I got scared, took the card and the keys, tried to act normal, and then I wanted to test if it was a real card. I went to the store, and the woman said that the card wasn't a real one. It was at this moment I decided not to go to her house, and I gave the keys in the car to the police. A friend of mine told me that she saw the exact same old lady saying the exact same thing she told me, and the scariest thing is that she saw a man bring her outside and then immediately go inside the apartment. The area where she was is known for being dangerous. There was recently a shooting between drug dealers and daylight, for example. I think I was nearly killed, or that something bad would have happened. A few years ago, I worked at a small local pet store during college. I was one of two women who worked there, and we generally didn't work at nights together. This store kind of specializes in saltwater fish and reptiles in particular, so it wasn't too odd to have newbie reptile or aquarium people, or people looking to just learn some more before actually getting a little companion. About a year into me working there, this one man would come in and start asking questions about bearded dragons in particular. I humored him for the first couple of times he came in and answered his questions for an hour and a half to two hours each time he came in. But then, he just kept coming in, not buying anything, not looking at other animals, refused to talk to my co-workers standing right next to me. He was definitely a dude with a creepy vibe, but after the third time this guy came in and questioned me about bearded dragon's mating habits for an hour, we all started getting uncomfortable. He knew my schedule because we were such a small store, I would call my friends and tell them to come hang out at the shop while he was there because he was just so persistent about talking to me and only about the bearded dragons with the occasional 
do you have a boyfriend or pick up line? I told him I wasn't interested each time, and I told him that I do have a boyfriend, even though I didn't. At first, we were all pretty forgiving, chalking it up to social awkwardness, but it started getting scary when he'd come in, looking for me, not finding me, but he'd find my car and then just hang out outside the shop. My boss started telling me to hide out in our back employee's room whenever he'd come in. My friends were weirded out. I was getting uncomfortable around him, and my co-workers were actively trying to curb his enthusiasm for coming in. I ended up quitting that job. Around a month later, I'm watching the news with my dad, and oh, we were in for a surprise. The same guy had been escorted off his ex's property in a local town by police. He came back to the house the same night and murdered her. When she didn't show up for work, her co-workers called for a welfare check. Police get there, he answers the door, and tells them that his name is Zeus. He lets police in, and they found her in the bathtub on a tarp. They also found bloody plates, silverware, and pans in her sink. He had cooked and eaten parts of her heart, liver, and brain. He's still waiting for trial in our state, and his interviews of news people questioning him while the police are escorting him to court are just crazy. He tried to claim demonic possession at one point. He had previously murdered two people and been released from prison before moving to our area. Trust your instincts about people you interact with. People are wild. For reference, we live in a state infamous for human trafficking, and the event took place at around 2am. My friend and I, both females, were driving down the road in the middle of nowhere, just to talk and clear our minds. You know, those roads out in the desert that stretch for miles, with no lights, that get pitch black and a little spooky at night. It was one of those. We were already a little paranoid given that we are both small females, late at night, in the middle of nowhere. If anything were to happen, no one would be around to see it. After probably 15 minutes of driving out into this area, without passing by a single vehicle, a black, either very large truck or SUV, I can't really recall despite it being a couple of days ago, comes up in the distance. They had their high beams on, so they would have seen that there were two females alone, past us on the opposite side. Immediately after passing us, they pull off and stop for a second, which alarmed us a bit, and then they pulled a U-turn, driving in our direction, which alarmed us a little bit more. The street was just a long stretch of straight road, continuing for miles. There is no logical reason for them to have turned around. Based on the layout of the land, this is not the kind of place you can make a wrong direction in. But regardless, if you are suspicious, it gets worse. They speed up until they're directly behind us, blinding us with their lights, which scared us even more. The next event made our stomachs drop and our breathing stop. They turned their lights off. We couldn't see them anymore. Aside from the brief shadow of a vehicle, if I really squinted into the dark. To say we were terrified was an understatement. All of the worst case scenarios were playing out in our heads. We had never been in this area before, and we were alone. We didn't want to call the cops, as they are notoriously unreliable. We were in the middle of nowhere, and we had weed in the car. Despite this, we felt safer knowing that, despite unreliable, we were in a vehicle. As long as we didn't stop or get out, we would stay safe, and so we did. For 30 minutes, but what felt like an eternity, this vehicle followed us with its lights off, and we never passed by another single vehicle out on the road. After driving back into civilization, finding a route that had no U-turns required, despite how much longer it would take, the vehicle let off, 
once there were streetlights and buildings in sight. I've been a stay-at-home mom since 2012. This fall, my youngest started kindergarten. I have two girls. So it was mid-morning, both of my girls are at school, and I'm laying on my bed reading a book. I can see through my open door, through the living room, to the hallway, that leads to my girls' room, their bathroom and playroom. I hear a noise and look up to see a middle-aged white male with blue gloves, similar to what a bug man would wear, walk in through my garage door. I freeze, not knowing what to do. I know my bug man, this is not him, and the guy didn't knock. He immediately heads down the hallway to where only my children's rooms are. I call my husband. My husband calls the police and his two brothers who live two minutes away. He must have gone to the playroom because maybe a minute has gone by. I'm going for a weapon and I hear my dog start to growl. She sleeps under my girl's bed during the day and so I yell, Here Belle, and the man comes out to the right where the garage door is at the front of the hallway. My Labrador Belle runs to me in my room. He stutters out, no one's supposed to be home, and I say my husband is on his way now and he mutters something as he exits the garage. I'm totally freaking out, but I get up, and of all the things I grab, I get a Maasai tiger stick my brother-in-law brought home from a missionary trip in Africa, and I run out after this guy. There's no car. He's gone. My brother-in-law and the police pull up at the same time, not a minute after the guy's made his exit. I told him I was fine. Maybe he was a bug man who got the wrong house. The police didn't pass a bugman vehicle on the way into my neighborhood. We have one entrance to the neighborhood, and that's when it hit me. The gloves he was wearing, they were the blue dental gloves my husband brings home from his office for me to clean with. They sit on a table right beside the garage door before you walk in. I ran back and checked my girl's room and then back to the playroom. The playroom window had been unlocked on both sides. I know it was the man because it had been extremely hot weather for weeks and I kept all the windows shut, locked, and blinds closed. So this happened a couple of years ago. We used to live in a house in the mountains. The only neighbor we had wasn't that close to our home, so there's quite literally no one around. This happened on a Sunday. I had my daughter, who was 13 at the time, coming for the weekend. She was sleeping upstairs, and I was in the living room watching TV when I decided to go outside to contemplate the stars. The thing is, I had to leave my door semi-open because there's only one handle, which was inside of the house and the other side of the door can only be opened with a key. I contemplated the stars for about five minutes, then I thought I could smell a weird smell. I went back inside. It was about 3 a.m., so I decided to go back to sleep. Then I woke up at about 6 a.m. I could see the sunrise, so I decided to open my window and stand up at the edge of it. Suddenly, I felt like a hand was pushing me in my back. I got pushed out of my window by someone, and the thing is, it was only me and my daughter in the house, and I got pushed out of my window by a stranger, and my daughter was still inside. The window was shut closed, I couldn't open it or the front door either, seeing as I didn't have my keys. I knew that my neighbor was a locksmith, so I subsequently rushed to his house, woke him up at 6 a.m and explained the situation to him. He took his stuff and came with me to my house. Now I'll tell you what my daughter told me. She told me that she could hear an old man coughing and that she didn't recognize the cough, so she instantly went into the bathroom and locked the door behind her. 
She then turned the tap on while she was calling the police. My neighbor managed to open the door. We rushed upstairs. Whilst going upstairs, I saw that a knife was missing from my knife set in the kitchen. We went upstairs and we saw that my daughter's bedroom door was opened. We turned on the lights and saw an old man with a hood holding one of my knives waiting in front of the bathroom door. My neighbor and I beat the living shit out of him and waited until the police came. The man got arrested and the week after that, we moved to another county. I'm a female and 27. I was home alone and sleeping in my bed in the middle of the night last night. I was woken up by the sound of someone trying to push up on my locked bedroom window. I couldn't see the window because it was past my footboard on the other side of the bedroom and I was laying down. But I knew that unmistakable sound of the window being locked and the jiggling sound it makes because I've locked myself out plenty of times and have tried to get through that window. I sat up to get a look, and I saw a dark silhouette of a person looking in through the window. I lay back down for a second, really confused and tired, and when it actually clicked what I had seen, I sat right back up. The figure was gone. I tried to get back to sleep, but I was spooked for the rest of the night. In the morning, I thought I might have dreamed it. After I called everyone I knew that it could have possibly been, and nobody knew anything. Nobody was at my house. Nobody I knew would just try to get into my bedroom window in the middle of the night anyway, especially when I don't think this person even knocked on the front door before trying to open the window. I went outside to investigate to see if I was crazy. I looked at the window, and there I saw handprints of whoever was trying to slide the glass up. It had also rained the night before, so I could see muddy shoe prints going to and from my window. I have no idea who they were or what they wanted, but I am so glad my window was locked. Alright, so, I am a server at a local restaurant in Texas. Today, I had a table that struck me as really odd. It was a man who appeared to be in his early 30s and a girl who looked around 8 or 9. So I understand that different families have different dynamics, but almost everyone wants separate dishes when sharing a salad. However, this grown man and child ate out of the same really small bowl, huddled close together, which I found strange. The girl wouldn't really look at me, and the man did all the talking. Not particularly out of the ordinary, but she was huddled down and hiding her face. Kids can be shy, but most of them at least sit up straight. I mentioned to the bartender that I found the man creepy, and he basically told me to write it off. So, I did. I pretty much ignored the bad feeling in my gut. After the two of them left, I walked over to their table to look at the receipt, just to see how much they tipped me. However, my attention was immediately caught by writing at the bottom. Along the bottom left portion of the receipt was written, I think you are very pretty, miss, with a smiley face next to it. Then, along the bottom it said, Not my dad. All of the writing appeared to be in a different handwriting than whoever wrote the tip. I found this really weird and I showed it to management, and they said to ignore it. My boss said the girl may have written a note that I was pretty, and then added on the last part to specify her dad didn't think that. I have no idea, and it's not really my business, but this entire interaction and the receipt gave me such a bad feeling, and I'm still kind of creeped out. I'm not sure if I should report it or even be concerned, but I figured I'd share.
So this is a story from around 10 years ago. At the time I was 16 or 17. After it happened, I kind of just brushed it off because nothing bad ended up happening to me. And I put it down to, I guess shit just happens to you when you're a woman walking alone at night. But looking back, now I realize how creepy it was. I was coming home on my own on a Thursday night after being out at a pub with some friends. We had been out a little more recently in the city, so I had to take a bus on my own to get home to my residential neighborhood. I had done this route hundreds of times before, so I didn't see it as being particularly dangerous, especially as I lived in a fairly nice neighborhood. It was only about 11pm, but because I lived in a residential area, when I got off the bus at my stop, it was absolutely dead and there was no one around. Again, this didn't spook me, especially as it was only a 5-10 to 10 minute walk from the bus stop to my house. As I turned down a long residential street that leads towards my house, I noticed a guy walking further down the street. This put me a little on edge, but I was reassured by the fact that he had his back to me and was walking away from me down the street. As I kept walking down the street, I noticed the guy turn around and clock me. That's fine, I thought. I always turn around when I hear someone walking behind me at night, so nothing weird about that. But I noticed as we got further and further down the street, he kept doing it. Kept checking I was still walking in the same direction as him. At this point, I'm starting to get pretty freaked out. Particularly as I am painfully aware that we are the only two people around. Just as I am weighing up what I should do, he turned down the path of one of the houses to the right. And I breathed a sigh of relief. He's going into his house. I was just being paranoid the whole time. The houses in my area are terraced with the front doors being kind of embedded into an enclave at the front of the house. What this means is that from where I was standing, which was about 50 feet away, I couldn't actually see the front door of the house as it was obscured by the wall. However, I saw him walk down the path and disappear into the front door enclave, so my logical conclusion was that he was letting himself into his house. I can't describe exactly what made me feel like this, but after the initial feeling of relief wore off, I suddenly got this really bad feeling. So I stopped walking and just stood there. There was this tiny voice in my head that said, what if he's just faking you out? The feeling became so strong that I stepped off into the pavement and ducked down behind a parked car and just waited. A couple of minutes of crouching behind the car Staring at the house, I saw movement and my heart stopped. The man came back down the path, out onto the street and was looking around. Looking for me. He must have been waiting for me in the doorway, knowing that if I kept walking, I wouldn't see him until it was too late. Unfortunately for him, his hiding place also meant that he couldn't see me. So when I didn't walk past as he anticipated, he had to come back out onto the street and try to work out where I was. Looking back now, I probably should have called the police at this point, but as a scared teenager, my fight or flight brain took over and I sprinted down one of the roads, running perpendicular to the street we were on, as I knew I could use it to take a slightly longer route home. I didn't stop running until I got home, where I quickly double locked the door behind me. Amazingly, I didn't even think to wake anyone in my family up. I just went to bed and then woke up the next morning and went to school. I dread to think what would have happened if I hadn't just suddenly got a bad feeling and stopped walking. Parts of me think that on some sort of subconscious level, my brain must have registered not hearing the front door shut after the man approached it and therefore triggered an alarm in my head but I had no perception of this at the time. Lesson learned. Trust your gut. I was walking down my street because I needed something from a store that was not too far away. It was daylight and there were plenty of people around. 
So as I'm walking, I see this guy I haven't seen before around my house. He doesn't live on my street, but he used to have a girlfriend that lives just a couple of houses from me. They dated for a long time, but at this point, they were broken up for almost as much time. For some context, this man is over 10 years older than me. I usually say hello, as it is something we do in my country a lot, especially in your neighborhood. Before I could even say anything, he raised his hand for me to do a high five with him. I did the high five and tried to lower my hand. Only, he wasn't letting go. He gently held my hand while speaking to me. The creep said to me, Hey sweetie, how have you been? I'm pretty good, how are you? I replied. He starts staring at my body, which is making me feel weird, so I say the first thing that comes to my mind. <laughs> I'm covered in dog hair. My dog is shedding right now. You look amazing. Like really, really good. He said to me. He says this with such a creepy smile and then looks me up and down a few times. He still is holding my hand. I was so uncomfortable that I just said my friend is waiting for me and left. My friend and I would joke around about him being a creep after I told her the story. It was funny until a couple of months later when his initials were all over the news. He tried to assault an underage girl. He threatened her with a knife and even cut her many times over her body. Thankfully, he wasn't successful in getting his way with her because she ran away and asked someone to call the police right away. He's in jail right now, but I still remember his creepy smile and the gentle yet disturbing touch. I hope he never sees sunlight again. This happened to my best friend about a year ago. We were both 18 at the time. My friend and I are female, and both about 5 foot 3 and 110 to 115 pounds, so we are easy targets. My friend and I went to the lake one day with a group of our friends. We were hanging out on the beach, playing cornhole and listening to music. After a few hours, my friend had to leave because she had work. I asked if she wanted me to walk with her to her car, and she said no. A few minutes later, she called me, and this is the story she told me. She got into her car with no issue. Before she left, she was sitting on her phone when she heard a knock on the driver's side window. A white trash middle-aged woman was standing right outside of her car, asking her to roll down the window. My friend was a bit startled, so she cracked her window slightly, and then she asked the woman, can I help you? The woman then told her that she needed help with her car and that she had jumper cables and asked my friend if she could walk with her to her car and give her a hand. Of course my friend told her she wouldn't be able to help much as she wasn't strong enough and that she didn't know much about cars. The woman begged her to help and said, my car is just right through those trees and pointed to an area that was completely empty. There was no car. My friend told her that she needed to go because she was going to be late to work. The woman put her hand on my friend's window and aggressively said, No, you need to come with me. My friend then threw her car in reverse and gunned it out of the parking lot. As she was driving away, she looked in the direction of where the lady pointed. She saw a large man hiding behind one of the trees. We suspected that the woman was trying to lure my friend out there so the man could grab her. They were most likely a team of sex traffickers. I have heard many people say that they use women to go up to girls because they are less sketchy. We have gone to that lake several times after and have never experienced anything like that again. Anyways, stay safe out there. I hope my friend and I never come in contact with that woman again.
I'm a 22-year-old female from Hawaii, and I live on the more countryside of my island, where not even Google Maps can tell you exactly where I live. To put it simple, I live in the boonies, and people who don't live by me don't come into the neighborhood, unless they're lost. I'm only saying this for context. About three days ago, I was in my driveway, on my way to catch the bus to work till a weird catering truck comes towards my house and pulled into my driveway. A middle-aged guy came out wearing a tacky aloha shirt only tourists would be seen wearing and dirty khaki shorts with run-down sandals. He looked dirty to say the least. It looked like he hadn't scrubbed in days. He asked me if I wanted to buy meat or seafood and I said no thanks. Then he asked if anyone was home. I lied and said my uncle hoping he would go away, but he didn't. Then he proceeded to compliment my looks, saying I have nice hair, then going on to say how beautiful island girls are, and how our curves are. Creepy stuff. It wasn't until my neighbor came outside that he drove away, yet once I turned the corner, there he was, and then he slowly drove behind me. I felt sketched out and called my mom, who's a dispatcher, and I told her what happened and how he looked. She told me she'd handle it. By that time, more people started coming out of the houses, and he left. Two hours later, I was at work, and she tells me that she got a couple of other calls about the same guy, with the exact description as me. I was asked to go to the station to say if I recognized anyone, and I pointed at his picture. They confirmed that he is a well-known sex trafficker, that they haven't been able to track for weeks. Since then, I've locked up my house as soon as my mom leaves for work. I haven't really slept since, and I've been throwing up or having panic attacks whenever I leave time for myself to think. I'm scared shitless and don't know what to do. He knows where I work, my house, my face, and it scares me to the point I've even covered up my windows just in case someone might try to look in. I live in a rural area. There's only a few houses within a mile of where I live. It was late fall 2007. One night, I was laying in bed asleep, and I woke up to what I thought was a girl screaming for help. It was about 1am, and I sat up and listened to see if I was dreaming. Then I heard it again, much closer this time. Help me, somebody help. Before I could get out of bed, some girl was pounding on my door, begging me to let her in. Not even giving it a second thought, I was racing down the stairs to see what was wrong. As soon as I got to the door, I could see her nose was bleeding and her mouth was cut. My first thought was that she was in a car accident. I found out differently almost immediately. I opened the door to let her in, and two steps behind her was her boyfriend. He was attacking her. She got through the door and tried to close it behind her, but he stopped it from closing by putting his hand on it. Now, I can only assume it was the adrenaline, but when the door popped open and he took one step in my house, I put my hand on his chest and pushed him back out the door, at least four to five steps. With my other hand, I pointed in his face, and I told him, if you take one more step in my house, it will be your last. His eyes got big and he was actually apologetic. I'm sorry sir, I'll leave. We called the cops and he was arrested. Turned out, they were at a bar and he hit her, so she left him there. He walked all the way to her house, which was about a quarter of a mile from my house. I just happened to be the first house she came across. This happened about five years ago, after my fiancé and I had been living in our house for a little over a year. I am six foot tall and about 225 pounds. 
I have always been naturally muscular, and I'm told I have an intimidating demeanor. My fiancé is 5'2", weighs maybe 130 pounds, a tiny little thing. Our house is a bi-level home where you walk in the front door, and there are two half staircases going up to the living room or down to the basement. The only access to our backyard is through the sliding glass door in the upstairs living room and down the stairs from our deck. During this time, I partied a lot, way more than I should have. I was between jobs and it was towards the end of the holidays, so my interest in finding a new job wasn't quite what it should have been. Many of these nights I was out partying, I would just end up crashing with a friend, which meant my fiancé spent many nights alone with our three dogs. I had a serious problem with substance abuse, primarily alcohol, and I'm sad to say I was letting it get the better of me. Fast forward a couple of months and I had just found a new job that had random drug and alcohol tests. I had been sober all of two days and had just begun repairing my relationship with my fiancé when she told me how glad she was I was sleeping at home again. I thought nothing of it, and kissed her on the head, and told her I was too, and that I loved her. Later that night, my fiancé and I were watching TV downstairs, when I thought I heard something moving in our backyard. The dogs heard it too, but I dismissed it because they just perked up their ears, but they didn't seem too alarmed. A moment later, I hear that noise again, and my fiancé very quickly mutes the TV and gives me a very nervous look. Did you hear that? She asked, looking very uncomfortable. I told her it's probably just a few of the neighborhood cats playing in our bushes, as there are quite a few outdoor cats living in the area, but she shook her head and began insisting that this wasn't the case. Before I could even ask her what made her sure, I heard our sliding glass door upstairs fly open. All three of my Great Danes and myself were on our feet in an instant. The dogs let out the most ferocious sounding barks I've ever heard and tore ass up the stairs with me right behind them. As I'm rounding the first set of stairs and the dogs are reaching the top of the second, I see the sliding glass door slam closed and the silhouette of a man running away. I get to the door and fling it open and the dogs shove me out of the way to chase after this would-be intruder. I grab my flashlight and run out into the yard. I had just made it down the deck stairs when I see the dogs freaking out at the back fence. I sprint over and jump the fence, just in time to see the man reaching the opposite fence and trying to get over it. He was covered head to toe in black clothing, a thick black hoodie with a hood pulled tight to conceal his face, and jet black cargo pants. Without any regret for my personal safety, I charge the man and just barely miss getting a hold of him as he makes it over the fence. Once more, I follow him over and come around the front of my neighbor's house just in time to see him hop into an old beaten up pickup truck and speed off. I watch for a moment as he tears out of the neighborhood and disappears into the night. I run back home as fast as I can to check on my fiance and make sure she's okay. When I walked into the house, she was sitting in the upstairs living room, surrounded by all three of our Great Danes, and clutching the biggest knife we own. She was visibly shaken, but ultimately, she is a very strong woman, and told me she was ready in case I got into trouble. After calling the cops, giving statements, and triple checking to make sure every door and window in the house was locked up tight, we decided to watch another movie, as neither of us were tired after that adrenaline rush we just had. During the movie, I asked her what made her so sure it wasn't cats playing in the yard. What she told me was enough for me to decide it was time to change my whole life. She said for about a month now, she had been hearing strange noises coming from all around the house, late at night. She would hear footsteps outside, and occasionally what sounded like whispering. When I asked her why she never told anyone, she just shook her head and said she didn't know. After hearing this, I came to the realization that whoever this man was, he knew that I was never home at night, and that my fiancé, essentially, was all alone most of the time. Fortunately for us, he somehow missed the fact that we have three Great Danes, and for whatever reason on this night, 
night, he decided not to check and make sure she was alone again. Since that day, I have been 100% sober from everything, and I have not left my fiancé alone overnight since. Our relationship has never been stronger, and our three Great Danes are three of the best dogs anyone could ask for. In the end, this experience has changed my life completely. When I was about 16 years old, I decided to get myself a job for the summer. This would be the very first job I had ever had, as my mom would usually provide me with money. I was pretty clueless on where to start, so my aunt did the heavy work for me and found me a job babysitting for one of her customers. She works at a salon, and the customer's name is Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a Nigerian man who always goes there to get a cut. She tells me he's extremely nice and presumes he's well off because he always tips well. I am excited because babysitting for a couple of hours and making good money sounds like music to my 16 year old ears. So about a week before I'm supposed to start babysitting Jeremiah's kids for the summer, I meet up with him. He introduces himself to me and wants me to meet his kids on a short trial basis for about an hour a day from Monday to Friday. He agrees to pay me $30 for the hour, as he was paying me $10 for each child, and there were three of them. I met with the kids and they seemed pretty easygoing. There was a two-year-old, Felicia, the five-year-old, Jeremiah Jr., and a seven-year-old, Evan. All in all, it seemed like it was going to be a good summer, but it wasn't. The first few days of the trial went great. I would come and see the kids and take them to a park or play a game with them until I had to go back home. However, on the Friday of that week, it started to get weird. I came to the house, as I usually did, and greeted Jeremiah and took the kids to the park, as I've been doing for almost four days now, routinely. However, this day was not like the rest. Jeremiah calls me 15 minutes into the day, screaming at me to bring back his kids. I was terrified that something had happened, so I panicked. I pack up the kids and we go back to the house. Once we are in the home, he tells the kids to go to their rooms. And this is where the horror begins. He tells me I'm no longer allowed to take his kids to the park. Confused, I ask why. He explains to me that his ex-wife often goes to the park and watches the kids and he's afraid for their safety. Well, let me tell you, this is news to me, as when I first met him, he specifically told me that he and his wife had gotten a divorce. Why? Because she had been bringing men back to the home. He also told me that her ex had lost her custodial rights and was in prison. So, you could see where I was confused. Nonetheless, whatever doubt and confusion I had in my mind, I pushed it down and swore to him that if I ever did see her around the house, I would call the police, as he also previously told me that he has a restraining order on her. He tells me never to call the police, if I see her, to call only him. Again, I pushed the doubt in my mind to the side and reluctantly agree. The first month of the summer goes well. I spent about four hours a day with them, and during those four hours, those kids are preoccupied with their gaming system, or riding their dirt bike, or doing whatever in their massive house. However, once July rolls around, things get a bit strange. Jeremiah starts coming home from work early on Wednesdays. That's not the strange part. The strange part is that he would come home early from work, and expect me to remain at home until my day was done. He also starts to recruit me to do things with his kids and him, like going clothes shopping, to the doctors, to the supermarket, and even the movies. I was starting to feel more like a nanny than a babysitter. When I would express the idea of going home, as I wasn't needed, he would always get upset and guilt me into staying, saying things like, the kids need you, 
This is your responsibility. I was annoyed, but I let it go, as I'm only spending four hours a day there and getting paid well. My sister, Michelle, on the other hand, would openly tell me how weird she finds Jeremiah and how she thought he was trying to groom me into being the kid's surrogate parent and his new wife. I left the idea off, as nothing mildly inappropriate has ever happened. That is, until one day. I arrived at the house as per usual, and Jeremiah leaves for work. About an hour into me being there, I hear a knock on the door. Before I can even ask who it is, Evan sprints to the door and swings it wide open. To my surprise, it's a woman. I ask her who she is, and she tells me she's the kid's mother. I'm shocked and frightened, as this woman isn't supposed to have any contact with these kids. I tell her Jeremiah is at work, and that I'm watching his kids in his absence. She gives me a very cynical look, and tells me that I can go home seeing as she is there now. I tell her Jeremiah told me not to let her in if she visits and that she needs to leave. I half expect her to curse me out, but to my surprise, she says, fine. She kisses the kids goodbye and leaves. I quickly, in a panic, phone Jeremiah and tell him the recent occurrence. He doesn't seem upset at all. He doesn't even seem surprised. Instead, he calmly thanks me for alerting him, and as he was ending the call, he tells me that I'm a good girl. Again, I'm a bit sketched out, but I continue to watch the kids. One day while I was there, I became curious of the nature of the relationship between the mother and the kids, since they didn't really seem to miss her at all while she was away. Therefore, I do the only logical thing I can do and proceed to pry answers out of heaven and Jeremiah Jr. To my utter disbelief, what I find out is shocking. It turns out, the reason why the kids barely seem to miss the mother is due to her never being gone. They tell me their mother comes home every day, right when Wheel of Fortune is coming on. I ask them if she stays or goes to her own home, and they tell me she sometimes spends the night in their dad's room. But when he is mad at her, she leaves. So I ask the next logical question. I ask Heaven why her dad is often angry at her mom. And she tells me it was because mom isn't a good listener. Right then and there, I get a chill. Because up until that point, it seems like I'm putting a puzzle together. But none of the pieces are matching. I start rewinding to certain things Jeremiah would say to me and certain things he would do that I didn't think much of. For instance, every time I was playing with Felicia when he was around, he would always tell me I'm a good mom. Not that I will be a good mother, no, that I am a good mother. He asks me if I am dating anyone, which I answer innocently that I'm not. He even asks if I'm sexually active, which I rightfully decline to answer. He becomes really touchy with me, always wanting to touch my hair or hug me goodbye. He comments on my appearance a lot, telling me that I'm attractive and I look in shape. He makes me stay later on certain days, even after he is home. And last but not least, Jeremiah starts to advise me to come in through the garage and not the front door when I come in in the morning. Each time I do, I am greeted by a shirtless Jeremiah who attempts to go in for a lingering hug. I honestly think he wanted something to occur in that garage. He would attempt to keep me in there, conversing with him, in the dark. It was a combination of those things, as well as what the kids told me, that makes me question the legitimacy of everything he has ever told me. I begin to think that maybe Jeremiah didn't want a babysitter, but a new wife to be the mother of his kids. As time progresses, I really begin to dread going over there. I would begin to get anxiety, even thinking about it. Nevertheless, I still continue to go, not telling a soul what is occurring. As more time passes, I find out even worse news. Jeremiah's ex-wife wasn't his ex. They are still married. He apparently abuses her often and is paranoid that she is having an affair with someone 
so we sent her away to Nigeria for a month. I learned all this from the women in the salon that my aunt works with. Not only that, but also that Jeremiah constantly brings women home while the wife is away. She finds out about this because she sometimes pretends to go to work and stays behind to watch for visitors. She has asked him for a divorce, which is why he sent her away. I also learn that he would regularly threaten to kill her if she ever leaves him. By the time the truth has come out, I am done. I have about a month and some change left, but I tell Jeremiah I can no longer watch the kids because I have to attend basketball camp which obviously was a lie. He became visibly upset and literally tells me that I have to continue to come back to work. I tell him I would not be doing so and that's when he starts to become irate. He then proceeds to call me some names and tells me that the only reason I want to leave him and the kids was because I was seeing other men. Mind you, I was 16 at the time with no obligation to watch over his kids or him. I leave that day crying and don't come back the next day. My mom asks why I'm no longer working there and I tell her it was because the job was too stressful. Well, about a week later, I am up in my room and heard the doorbell ring. I didn't think much of it until I hear Jeremiah's voice. I creep down to the living room to see him casually sprawled over one of our couches as if he lives here. I hear his booming voice directed at my mother in what I presume to be his authoritative voice. He states, We need to talk about my girl. She hasn't been to my house in a bit and the kids are starting to get a bit worried. I don't like that. Where is she? My mother, picking up on the strangeness of the situation, lies and tell him I have left with a friend. To which, he has the audacity to ask whether it is a male or female. Well, that is the straw that breaks the camel's back. My mom tells Jeremiah that his questions are invasive and predatory. She then tells him to leave, and he does, to my surprise. From then on, I don't see or hear of Jeremiah for about a year. He did message me, but I quickly learned to block his number. So, after a year... I learned some more information. His wife has gotten full custody of the kids, and they are living in another city about an hour from where we do. I thought that was miraculous, because Jeremiah makes it abundantly clear that those kids and his wife are his. A few months after learning that information, I am jogging in my neighborhood when I wander by his house. I try to sprint past it, but I am dead from my run, so instead, I opt to cross the street and stay a good distance from his house, in case he is nearby. I guess God was mad at me that day, because out of nowhere, Jeremiah pulls into the road and stops his car near me. He rolls down his window and asks how I've been. I am scared shitless, but he is pretty civil, despite how we left things. He babbles on about himself and makes some off comments about my body. But what catches my attention is what he says toward the end of our conversation. He tells me his wife has tricked him into losing custody of his kids. And this is how he tells it. She called him at work one day and tells him Jeremiah Jr. is acting up. Being the abusive piece of shit he is, he rushes home to show Jeremiah some discipline and respect. Well, his wife records the whole thing. The police are called and a report is filed, and I guess that is how she was awarded temporary custody of the kids. However, he assures me that he will get his kids back because they are his, and his wife will soon pay for her transgressions. The whole conversation makes me feel extremely uneasy, and I am glad when it ends. I run home and briefly tell my sisters about it, and then never think about it again. That is until I hear the news. A few weeks before my birthday, from my aunt of all people, Jeremiah has gotten his kids back. His wife mysteriously falls ill and goes back to Nigeria and then passes away. I know it sounds crazy, but this is exactly what my aunt tells me. I am again frightened 
after hearing that news, and I disclosed to my sisters what he told me the few months prior to her death. About a year after that, I'm jogging again and pass his house. This time, he comes out of his home to wave me down. He asks me if I want to say hi to the kids. I tell him no, because they probably wouldn't remember me. He then asks something shocking. He asks if I want to say hi to his wife. He calls her to come out. I am then approached by a very young woman, probably a few years older than me, with the baby on her arm. She smiles and politely introduces herself. I am in shock, so I exchange pleasantries and finish up my jog. When I get home, I tell my sisters what I had just witnessed. I don't know if Jeremiah did anything to his wife, but I have an eerie feeling in my gut that he is not all that innocent. When I was 17, I wanted to be an au pair, and the only place that I could go to as a 17-year-old was England. So I found this family, a mother with two kids, a boy and a girl. I messaged them and talked with the mother. She seemed very interested and very nice. We set up a date for me to go, and that was that. When I got to the airport, I was very confused that they weren't there to pick me up. I messaged the mother to ask where they were and if it would be long for them to get me. She told me that she was on her way, but she was just stuck in traffic. I thought, okay. That's fair. She told me to go to the exit and wait. Then not long after, she told me that she was there and she was in a blue car. I was looking around all confused since I couldn't see a blue car. When I finally found it, some other woman that the one I had been talking to walked out of the car and then towards me. The instant I made eye contact with the other woman, I got a long text from the woman I was supposed to work for where it basically said, that her husband had come home from the country he worked in and that they fought because he didn't want an au pair in the house and for some reason she didn't want to tell me that so she just gave me to her good friend who needed an au pair. I was very confused and by that time a bit scared. It all seemed very weird as if someone was watching me and had been waiting for the right moment to send the text. The woman seemed friendly but was hurrying with taking my things and putting them in her car while she was talking to me. I am a bit nervous and non-confrontational by nature, so I didn't really know what to do or say other than just follow her in what she was doing. When it was all done, she told me that we should get going, and I told her that I wasn't really comfortable with it at all. She said she understood, but that she really needed the help and also had two children at home. We had to move fast because of the place she was parked, so we got out of the car and started driving out of the airport. The second we started moving, I told her that I was very uncomfortable with this and really wanted to get out and stay at the airport. She seemed a bit upset by this and told me that she could drop me off, but she had to get out of where we were because she couldn't get a ticket for letting me out there or something. I'm not sure how true this is, it's just what she told me. We drove for a few minutes, still on the airport grounds, and we stopped a bit away so I could get out and call my parents. I talked to them, sobbing the whole time. I noticed that while talking to them, the woman was inside her car, talking to a woman. The one I had been talking to, I presume. I didn't understand the language, so I can't say what they were talking about. When I was done talking, I got into the car again and I told her that I really wanted to let me out, and she kept asking me if I was sure, and if I didn't want to go to town with her, if I didn't want her to drop me off by the shopping center. I of course told her no, that I really just wanted to let me out by the airport. She did, thankfully, and I went inside and talked with my parents. After this happened, I got some weird voice memos from her and two other people. I couldn't understand them, but it was very weird. My parents also tried contacting her, and she blocked them both. If you don't know, 
A lot of our pairs are being treated very poorly, so for us to feel safe and secure, and sure that we don't get cheated out of pay, or working more than we are allowed, we have to sign a contract. Later on, I found out that the contract she had sent me was fake, and not really binding. I don't know how, but it wasn't legitimate. Her addresses she had sent me were also fake, and she didn't apparently live there either. I found out after that the city I was supposed to stay in is a bit of a hot spot for trafficking. I didn't know that until after it happened. A lot of very sketchy stuff. I might be overthinking this. It might not be as bad as I think it was. But in the moment of it, I was sure something was going on. Two years ago, right around Halloween, I was babysitting for these two ladies who each had a son. They wanted to go out, so I stayed at one of their houses and watched their boys. It was around 8pm and the boys were sitting on the couch, playing on their iPads and whatnot, when somebody knocks on the door. I asked them if anyone was supposed to come over and they both said no. I go over and check the eye hole in the door and it's some guy in a grey hoodie, deliberately hunched over so I can't see his face. Immediately in my mind, I say no, and don't say anything and start pacing around because I don't want to give him any inclination we're inside. A couple of minutes later, I check the outside little window through the curtains, and he's gone. I didn't want to spook the kids anymore, and there weren't any more knocks, so I just kind of let it go as a prank. Cut to a few hours later, and the moms get back. They ask me how everything was, and I say the kids were great, but somebody had come to the door. They ask me what time, and I say around 8, and one of the moms starts freaking out and going through her phone. The other one tells me that right around that time, somebody had been making strange phone calls to them on a blocked number. They had disguised their voice, and they were saying things like, I can see you through your window. They didn't think it was serious, because it didn't make sense in the context of where they were, but in retrospect, they were almost positive he was looking at me. They escorted me to my car, and I got home later. Apparently, nothing strange ever happened after that, but I am just really glad I didn't open the door, because I have a feeling in my gut it would have been really bad. So when I was around two or three years old, my mom and dad, who are now divorced, were friends with this couple who worked with my dad at his office. They would always ask to babysit me and love seeing me a lot, and my parents thought nothing of it. One day, they asked to take me to Disney World along with their niece, and my mom had no issue with it. My dad, on the other hand, thought it was weird because they offered to pay everything for me. He had told them no and made up an excuse for me not to go. The couple weren't seen for weeks after that, and the company that my dad and they worked for were having an investigation because the same couple who wanted to take me to Disneyland committed massive fraud and stole hundreds of thousands of dollars. They disappeared, and my dad has no idea what happened to them since he no longer works there, but he fully believes that they wanted to take me and disappear. He thinks they couldn't have kids on their own, and they really wanted one. But still, it creeps me out that I could have had a different life and family. Thank God my dad was home, because my mom wanted to let me go. I'm a female, and when I was 16 or 17, I would babysit for a set of twin 8-year-olds that lived across from the street from me. 
It was the ideal summer job. I ferried them to and from various activities, and in between, we spent nearly every second outside. Every day was a new adventure. Adding to the fun, the twins' family owned a medium-sized, sweet as pie, poodle mix who loved people more than anything. This dog was incredibly smart, gentle, and loving. She wouldn't have harmed a fly. We could count on her to go on adventures with us. She would follow us at a far pace, exploring on her own, but always keeping with an earshot. Whenever we met new people, she would gleefully bound towards them, eager to lick them and get pets, and express how happy she was to see them. She was the best. I remember one late summer morning, we decided to spend a few hours drawing on the front driveway in chalk. The kids drew while I laid on the driveway with the dog, soaking up the heat. Not many adults were around. It was a weekday and most were at work, but we couldn't have felt safer in the midday sun in the safety of our suburb. Occasionally a neighbor would walk down the street and the dog would sit up to greet them while I spent a few minutes making small talk. This continued for a while and I was getting really relaxed by the heat and the sound of the kids playing and laughing. The dog was resting beside me, dozing, when suddenly I heard a low growl coming from her. It was a noise I'd never heard her make before and it took me by surprise. I sat up and looked around immediately and there, Coming down the sidewalk towards me and the kids was a man I'd never seen before. He was older and a bit haggard looking and he was watching us like a hawk. The dog was having none of him and her growl got slowly louder and more intense as he meandered towards us. This should have been a sign to me, but I didn't know anything. I was 17 and too young to understand to trust my gut. All I knew was to be polite. He stopped, with a laser focus on me, and started trying to have a conversation with me. This was normal. Other people had walked by and done the same throughout the morning, but he was asking weirder questions. Questions about our plans for the day, what I was doing with the kids, where their parents were, that kind of thing. It was unnerving, but he was an adult, so I tried to answer in a polite but vague way. He kept trying to get closer to me, and his gaze turned into something more like a leer. Anytime he moved near though, the dog would growl louder, and she started barking viciously. I had never seen her act like this, and it actually got to a point where I was holding her back and trying to calm her down, all while apologizing for her behavior. He faltered in the presence of her, even though she wasn't big. She was standing her ground and protecting me. Just as quickly as he had been coming closer, he backed off, said a quick goodbye, and hurried away down the street. I never saw him again, and in the many years I babysat for that family, I never saw their dog behave that way either. I have always, always wondered if she sent some threat from him that I wasn't able to pick up on. I truly think she protected me from something awful. It could have been nothing, but I have never forgotten that encounter. I have wanted to share this story and a couple of others for a while. To this day, this remains the scariest thing I have ever experienced and I really hope it serves as a cautionary tale to young women who make solo trips during the day or night. That one is no safer than the other. Moving on, a little backstory. From 1994 to 1999, I made close to weekly trips from my home in Vegas to Orange County, an arrangement made to facilitate visitation of my daughter with her father whom I have a violent past with as a domestic violence victim. I did the drive to avoid him being in my space because he had stalked me before. So, in October 1996, I am making the trip on a Friday night 
because I had work until 6, Monday to Friday, so I usually didn't get on the road until 8 or 9. I used to love the dark mystery of the 15th South at that time of night, plus there wasn't usually traffic. So, as I'm approaching Baker, California, I exit the freeway to stop at my daughter and I's favorite gas station, which has super clean bathrooms. The things you learn after making a drive hundreds of times. This night was foggy and super, super dark, but the gas station was well lit. Deciding to top off gas after using the bathroom and getting snacks, I had pulled up to a pump close to the store's door. That night, we were the only customers inside the gas station, but once we got outside, there was another car pumping gas at the furthest pump from mine. I was busy putting my baby girl into her car seat and getting a blanket and snacks just right before the next three hours on the road. My head was down, so the man at the other pump was not in my field of vision, but I could literally feel eyes burning into my back. Never before or since has the hair on my arms or the back of my neck raised, while my pulse raced for no evident reason. As dread radiated and my ears were even buzzing in alarm, my head snaps up and I instinctively spin around to assess the situation. That's when I saw the face on the man. An expression of pure hate towards me, a total stranger, someone I've never met in my life, his brows furrow eyes squinting and scarily staring at me. I lost my breath. I was so spooked. I finished pumping quickly, hurried into the car, dramatically locking all four doors, and I got out of there like it was on fire. It took me a few minutes to calm myself down and stop shaking. After a while, I put it behind me, trying to convince myself he thought I was someone else. Unfortunately not. Around 30 miles down the 15, approaching Barstow, a weird light started shining into my car from the car to the right lane of me, so bright I could see nothing of who was driving or what. I ignored it, speeding up to lose this asshole, then it was gone. I assumed whoever it was got off the freeway a while back and I just hadn't noticed. Good riddance. Then, a car pulls up behind me, and a red light flashes, along with a weird sounding horn honk. I assume I'm being pulled over for speeding. I pull to the shoulder and stop to wait for the officer to approach my window. I know not to stare directly at cops. My eyes are straight forward. My daughter is sleeping. My windows are rolled up. I decided to roll it down when he gets to my car, so... I'm waiting, and waiting, and waiting. Mind you, this is before everyone had a cell phone, and travelers relied on call boxes every half mile to use for emergencies. Then I look over to my side mirror. It was so dark. All I saw was a guy standing there, his head anxiously swiveling, kind of like he's not wanting any cars around to see him. Then, I notice a badge, but not on his chest. It was on his pants. I could see he was wearing jeans as my eyes adjusted. It was like the badge was clipped onto his waistband. And then, the stare. I feel the same fear I had less than an hour ago. My baby wakes up, and I see her beautiful face in my rearview mirror, and this creepy guy in my side mirror. My survival instincts kicked in. Details about this encounter were alarming me, and I was again choked up and shaking like crazy. My heart was racing. All of a sudden, in a split second, I felt something whisper, then loudly demand I get away. It was as if something took over my body. I turned the key, shifted into first, and slammed onto the gas, spraying gravel in my way. I must have got up to 90 miles per hour. I had zero alcohol or drugs in or on me anywhere, and that gave me the confidence thinking, go ahead, follow me to the next police station. All of a sudden that car passed me, and I saw it was the gas station guy, as well as a fake cop guy. 
I also saw a red siren light, like they used to sell at Spencer's Gifts. I actually laughed at how ridiculous this was. Then I got pissed. These creeps had seen me with my baby at the gas station. He knew an instant baby girl was in my car, but he wanted to harm me anyway. I've had some creepy encounters before, but this is the only one where I'm positive I was in danger. So, I was 17 and I really wanted to learn how to play guitar. This guy I had a crush on offered to teach me to play, so we decided to meet at a park one summer afternoon. I got there a bit early and decided to just wait at a bench inside one of those small hut things you see in every generic suburban park. Despite it being really nice outside that day, the park was pretty empty. I think it was just me and some people off in the distance, just walking around the lake, but nowhere near me. So I'm just sitting there, using my phone and waiting for the guy to come. And all of a sudden this lady pops up out of nowhere. She was a fairly small lady that seemed to be in her 40s or 50s. I specifically remember her being incredibly thin and almost dirty looking, despite having her hair and makeup done well, and wearing very nice clothing. So, she walks up to me and tells me that she likes my shoes, to which I give her a big smile, and tell her where I got them. That was probably my first mistake. Then she sits down and starts a conversation with me, asking how old I was, where I lived, where I went to school, all of that stuff. Now I immediately thought this was weird, but my hometown is super safe. The lady was incredibly small, so I knew I could take her if I needed to. She was speaking with an accent and didn't seem to know much English, so I figured that maybe she was new here and wanted to make friends. Plus, I didn't want to seem rude, so I kept talking to her and just giving her vague answers whenever I could. And then all of a sudden she says, Oh, you're so beautiful. I love your skin and hair, and without giving me time to react, pulls out her phone and takes a photo of me. Okay, now I'm starting to freak out, but I tell myself that maybe this was just a cultural difference, and she wasn't actually that weird. So I just kinda didn't react, and just hoped the guy would show up soon. So at this point, the lady has been talking to me for about 15 to 20 minutes. I'm getting pretty weirded out. I'm trying to make my responses to her as short as possible, in the hopes that she'll leave. But she doesn't. Finally, the guy shows up. He is a big military guy that doesn't look like someone you'd want to mess with, so I immediately felt safe and made it clear that I knew him. Because this lady was sitting so damn close to me, he thought we knew each other. So he went up to her and introduced himself. She did not like that at all. Her face kind of fell as soon as she saw him. She tried to hide it, but still hardly spoke to him or acknowledged him at all. She instead turned to me and asked if he was my boyfriend. He and I very quickly said no and made it clear we were just friends. Well, apparently she completely ignored us saying that, because almost immediately she gets up and says, Oh, you guys are such a cute couple. She pulls out her phone and takes yet another photo of me, but this time in a way that she got my full body in the shot. After she takes the photo, she pretty much immediately leaves. I noticed that she went around a big corner towards the bathrooms and just disappeared. I never saw her come out of another side. The guy I was with asks if I knew the lady. I said I didn't and that she just started talking to me. We both just kind of thought, huh, weird, and then we go about our guitar lesson. Having my crush at the time teach me how to play guitar was clearly my main focus at this point, and I pretty much forgot about the weird encounter. I didn't really mention it or think about it again. That is, until about a year later. So for a bit of context, pretty soon after my encounter at that park, I moved away to Spain for a year for college. So now this story takes place there. 
I was sitting in my dorm one night, falling down a YouTube rabbit hole, and I stumbled upon videos of people telling their sex trafficking stories, and all of their encounters seemed very familiar to me. All of a sudden, I remembered the encounter I had with that lady at the park. I decided to Google sex trafficking in my hometown to calm my nerves, because there was no way this lady was a sex trafficker, right? Oh, was I wrong. I Google my hometown, and immediately an article pops up about a woman being arrested in my hometown in September for running two sex trafficking rings in my hometown, just two months after I had met her. I'm thinking this can't be the same lady, and I continue reading about how she kidnapped women and girls in my town, and then held them hostage in a massage center, and then she would sell them out of the US and ship them out of the country, stuff like that. And then I get to a mugshot, and my blood goes cold. On the screen, I see a small lady, with a description saying she's in her 50s. I recognize her immediately and freak out. I FaceTime the guy I was with at the time, and I showed him mugshots to confirm it was her. And without me saying anything, he says, Oh, that's the lady we met in the park. Needless to say, I lost my shit and was freaked out for a day or two. The thing that probably freaks me out the most was that as far as I'm able to find, she was the only person arrested and there is no way this lady worked alone. She was incredibly, incredibly tiny, enough to the point that I didn't feel threatened by her at all when we interacted and there was no way she would be able to take someone without help. Yet no one else was found guilty of sex trafficking in my hometown or anywhere nearby. I have since moved back to my hometown, and I truly think that moving away for a year may have saved my ass. Although, I still don't know if someone else has those pictures of me. So this was way back around two years ago, when I was still struggling with trying to find a job and becoming financially stable. Anyway, my phone bill arrived and I had to pay it soon. I didn't want to be in debt, so I was trying to find a job for at least a quick buck. It was Sunday. In my country, most people aren't allowed to work on a Sunday. It was around 9pm. I also want to add that I was at my mother's house, and I invited my friend over to hang out. That being said, I ended up having a look for a job ASAP. Lo and behold, I see an ad. Distributing leaflets will pay well. I am doubtful, but call the person anyway. Hi, uh, I'm calling about the offer? Yes. Are you still looking to hire? Yes. I see. And how much would the pay be? How much would you like to be paid? At this point, my mother is waving her arms, trying to show how much. She's telling me to ask for 200 of our currency. Usually in this job distributing leaflets, you'd be lucky to get, I don't know, around 16 of our currency per hour or so. So naturally, as you can imagine, that I thought this would be crazy. But hey, I honestly didn't think I would get the job. So what the hell? I went with it. Well, um... How does 200 sound? Deal. Oh, that's great. When can I start? Tell me where you live, and I'll be there in 20 minutes. Um, you want me to work now? Yes. On a Sunday? Yes. At 9 in the evening? Yes. Tell me where you live, so that I can come and pick you up. Hmm. Pick me up at the crossing between Vermont Street and Reef Street. Okay. I'll be there in 20 minutes. Well, I would like to know what this job is exactly. You said leaflets, but what leaflets? I'll tell you when I pick you up. I'd rather know this in advance. Look, I'm going all the way to meet you. We will talk when I pick you up. Oh, okay. A huge part of me wanted to drop the phone, 
but another part of me was thinking, hey, as unlikely as it might seem, it still might be legit. So I went halfway and just told him to meet me at a crossing a bit further away from where my mother lives. I hatched a plan. First of all, I am not going into a stranger's car just like that. This is sketchy as fuck. Secondly, who hires a leaflet guy for such an insanely high pay? And third of all, a person who doesn't want to talk about the details before picking them up is definitely up to something. So I hatch a plan. I tell my mother and friend to hang around in the area where I'm supposed to meet the guy so that either he will not try to do anything since there were witnesses or so that they can all call the cops should anything happen. Plus, my friend would have my back. Okay, so 20 minutes pass by. A black SUV rolls on the crossing that is empty of all cars and people because of course it's Sunday evening. The windows roll in. Some man pops his head out and he signals me to get into the car. I of course refuse and tell him I need to talk about the details regarding the job first. I look through the guy's open window and I see a woman sitting beside him. Come on, I haven't got time for this. I'm sorry, but I don't know you. I'm not going to get into a stranger's car just like that. What am I going to do? Kidnap you? I don't know you. You are a stranger to me. If you want, we can talk about the details of the job and then I will tell you if I will get in the car or not. The guy's face grows red. I already know things are going to take a turn for the worse. He rolls up his window, screeches his car down one of the roads, parks it next to the nearest free spot, and gets out of the car. The guy had a comically large beer belly, and he starts angrily stomping to me. I think to myself, ah, playing the angry card, are we? He gets closer to my face than anyone would ever dream of and starts his godfather spiel. I drive all the way through the city to pick you up and now you tell me you won't get in the car. I already told you, no offense, but I don't know you. You're expecting me to get in the car with a complete stranger. If you want, we can talk about further job details right now. After which, I will tell you whether I accept the job or not. What am I going to do? Kidnap you? Well, I don't know that, do I? The guy's face reddens even more. He plays the, I'm too pissed off to talk to you, my friend. Good cop will talk to you instead. As he tells me that, and we walk to his car, where I talk to Mrs. Good Cop at a safe distance from the car, the lady seems kind and polite. Finally, she explains how it all works that they give me leaflets to a nightclub, which is why they are doing this at this time, since all the nightclubs are open right now. They drive me to a location where I give away the leaflets for an hour or two, and afterwards, once I'm finished, I call them to pick me up and they pay me a hundred of our currency. Note that the guy already said okay for two hundred. Yeah, no. You really expect me to believe that I would just get into a stranger's car and just be dropped off, assuming I'm not being kidnapped? to God knows where, to do a job without a contract, and then be gullible enough to think that if I call them after the job is done, they won't just ghost me and not pay me. The fuck are they smoking? Once the lady explains everything, I politely decline. The guy keeps trying to butt in with his whole what am I gonna do kidnap you spiel over and over again, but I just bullshit my way out of it by saying some stuff in the lines of, well, you say you are very busy, and don't have time for this, so I don't want to waste your time on this. Goodbye. The guy clearly had enough, gets in the car, smashes the door, and drives off with a screech. I hope I never meet those guys ever again. I was just a 12 year old boy riding my bike home from a friend's house, as I did most weeknights after school. We lived in a middle class neighborhood, so my parents never concerned themselves with letting me ride around, sometimes until it got dark. This particular evening, there was some light left, and I turned a corner and started to descend a steep hill, 
That led to my street at the bottom. Something didn't feel right, and as I cruised down this hill without needing to pedal, I sensed the car next to me was following me. I looked to my right as I was on the footpath and not the road. I could clearly see the car was following me at a pace slower than the posted speed limit. I decided to see if my instincts were correct and I started to pedal faster to see if the car would speed up too. It did. As I crossed over one street that branched off the road I was descending, he sharply pulled his car in to cut me off but I responded quickly and took a wide berth around his car as he almost hit my bike. I was now experiencing sheer terror. I pedaled as fast as I could back down the hill. I knew if I crashed now, something terrible would happen. I could hear the car rev its engine wildly as he attempted to catch up to me. My ears pricked up, trying to establish how close he was. And I saw his car fly past me and pull up sharply into a driveway just in front of me. I pulled into that driveway, in front of his car, and noticed I had no room to get past the car to continue down the hill. So I was trapped. I dropped my bike to the ground and ran towards the front door of the house where he had effectively trapped me. He got out of the car and stood behind his door. He said to me, Get in the car, I'm a policeman. My father was a cop, so the first thing I said was, Show me your badge. Not that I would have gotten into the car if he had one, but I knew it was unlikely that he did. He shouted at me to get in and started to close his door so he could walk towards me. I shouted if he took another two steps, I would open the front door of the house and start screaming. He jumped back in the car and sped off. Whenever I watch Mystic River, I can't help but get goosebumps. Okay, so this happened around 2002. I moved to Belfast from London, and I would have been like 11. I'm 30 now. Anyway, I lived in a new area. A lot of houses were being built, and they were all massive and beautiful homes, despite being in a terrible area I thankfully no longer live in. I'm with a friend called Dave. We're looking for my sister, and we go around the corner from my house down where they're building a bunch of houses, and it's pretty dark. I'd probably say it's like 10 or 11 p.m. I don't really remember why we were actually looking for my sister. I don't even think she was around. Anyway, we're walking past the house that looks pretty much finished. We're chatting, and a guy randomly shows up out of the blue behind us. He grabs a hold of me. Dave, by this stage, is batshit petrified. He runs away crying and climbs over a fence, completely ditches me. The guy is very casual, despite being creepy, and I'm not as freaked out as I should be. I assume he's a Pravi, which is someone who watches the streets in West Belfast. He's got a hold of me, and it's like when you've been caught in a place you shouldn't be in. I expect him to just be like, you shouldn't be here at night whilst we're patrolling the streets. But suddenly... We go to a house which isn't completely built yet, and nobody lives in it. Well, I think. I'm standing inside this basement-looking house while he's outside phoning the cops. I assume he's fake calling the cops. The conversation sounds fake, and he sounds like he's just trying to scare me, and he is. I get really freaked out now, though, because upstairs there's like a constant tapping sound. It can't be a builder by himself at like 11pm, surely. It sounded like someone locked in something, trying to get out. That scared me. It was the speed of the sound, as if they knew I was in the house. It sounded like they were trapped upstairs or something. Suddenly, he's off the phone. Okay, the cops are coming to your house soon. Leave now. I'm thinking, nah, not really. I didn't give him my address, but at the same time I was freaking out, because maybe this guy knows the streets, and where I live. So that entire night, I was just looking at my window, hoping no cops would come. They didn't in the end, 
and he obviously did all that just to scare me. But why? This situation for me is scary because a guy randomly grabbing a hold of you in the streets in pitch black darkness is freaky regardless or not of whether or not it's a building site and I probably shouldn't have been there. He could have put me in a room and locked the door or even had someone torture me or something. I've always wondered why he was there. What was he doing? Afterwards, I was scared to go out at night in the area unless I had someone with me. Truth be told, there were a lot of issues in the area and I'm guessing that guy and a bunch of other guys were acting like undercover cops since the cops weren't usually comfortable coming up to where I live due to the fact they'd usually get bricked. Looking back though, I think the entrance was blocked off and we weren't actually allowed in there. Considering the situation, I was actually pretty calm compared to my friend, and I have terrible anxiety. I think I just assumed this guy wasn't bad, but again, on any given day, he could have been bad. There's a park about a two minute drive from my house and about a seven minute walk. We were hanging out at the park and having a good time. We noticed a man on a bench just staring at us. It was around 6 p.m. and the park was decently full. I'm disabled, so I just assumed he was giving me a look for that. It's a pretty normal occurrence. I've even had people tell me that I'm too young to be using a cane or to stop faking it. After a while, we left the park and went home. About an hour and a half goes by and we noticed her phone was missing. We couldn't find it anywhere and we decided to go back to the park to look. At this point, it was dark and kind of foggy, but I've walked through this park a million times at night to go graffiti down in a storm drain just a little bit further away from the playground. It was 8.30pm. We got out of the car to look where we sat the entire time. It wasn't there, so we went back to the car to have a look there. We opened three of the four doors and turned on all the lights in the car, and all of a sudden I had a sense of danger go down my spine. It struck me at the core. I told my sister to get in the car and lock the doors. We did. We sit there for a bit while I try to regain my thoughts and figure out exactly why I felt like that. The car fogged up while we were sitting there. I wiped some of the fog off the front windshield in my view from the passenger side. That's when I saw him. A man all alone in his mid-thirties, standing by a lamppost, staring directly at us. I watched him intently and he started walking towards the car. We were both scared shitless. She had noticed him too and all we could do was watch, horrified. He got about two feet from the car and acted like he was going to walk past the car. All of a sudden, he jumps out and aggressively tries to get into the car, jiggling the handle hard. I told my sister to start the car and go. She puts the keys in the ignition and backs out, running over his foot. He pulls something out of his pocket and reaches down to the back tire, swinging what I now think was a knife. We drive home and call the police. They arrive and said he didn't commit a crime and therefore wouldn't investigate. I make a post on next door to warn parents to not let their children come to the park alone since the park is in the neighborhood. I had a woman message me privately that he had come to her house selling pest control and then asked to enter. She sent me a doorbell picture and sure enough, it was him. I took note of the company name on the shirt and called them, telling them what happened to see if it was a misunderstanding. They told me he doesn't work for them and pointed out the logo on his shirt. Although it had the company name, it was a different color and didn't belong to them. I looked through tons more pest control companies in the entire state. I found nothing else matching the company name.
When I was much younger, I used to go out and party almost every night. I couldn't stand being at home, so being out in town felt good, especially with friends. We would go bar hopping, and one of the pubs that we frequented was called Poppin. We would get wasted, as the alcohol here is dirt cheap, due to the island being duty free. So imagine being teenagers and being wasted most of the time. Not a good combination, and bad things are bound to happen. I grew up on this island, and I know many of the townsfolk here. It's a relatively safe place to be, being a small island. You could literally leave your car doors unlocked, and no one would steal your car. Hence there's nowhere to run, and the only way out of the island is either by flight, speedboat, or Aurora Ferry. So, back to the story. I was out one night with my buddies as usual, having some drinks at the local pub. We were having a great time listening to the live bands that were playing. It was crowded inside, and people were drinking and dancing. Me and my friends were too. My friend's name is Steve. See, Steve and I were close, and I knew him since we were in high school, and at this current time, I was in my 20s. We were good friends. And while we were in the pub, he suddenly called me to go outside and accompany him to go see someone. Curiously, I followed him outside, and when I asked him, he just told me to back him up, and that the guy we were going to meet was apparently dating Steve's younger sister, and Steve didn't like that one bit, since his sister was still in high school. So, when he came, Steve warned him not to disturb his sister and to stay away from her, which I thought was fair. Then, being the hero wannabe, I bought it in. I started telling him the same thing, and he wasn't taking it one bit from me. He got really pissed. He said that I was going to regret opening my mouth and just walked off. We went back inside and I started calling friends, telling them that a fight was going to go down, as I knew that guy was going to go call his friends as well. About 15 minutes passed and I got called out. This guy had brought 15 to 20 guys and they surrounded me and Steve. Then this guy's uncle pulled me aside and slapped me, saying that I was a dead man. I tried to fight back, but then he did something that really shook me up. He was brandishing an army knife from his back jeans, the kind that had serrations near the base of the blade, the kind that could literally be used to pull your guts out. Yeah. It was that kind of knife. I froze as I didn't know what to do as he was holding onto my t-shirt with one hand and had a knife in the other. Immediately I thought to myself, Ah oh, shit, I'm gonna get stabbed and probably killed tonight. So much was racing through my mind and I couldn't think. According to Steve, most of these guys had weapons on them. One of them even had the classic broken beer bottle and was ready to hurt us. Then out of nowhere, my brother-in-law came screaming, saying that he was a cop and that backup was coming if they didn't settle it there and then. My brother-in-law is a big guy and stands at almost six feet tall, so I knew that they believed that he was a cop and started to settle down. The guy that was dating Steve's sister still wasn't satisfied and wanted to fight me one-on-one. -on -one. At first, I denied him, but after he kept asking, I just said yes. Luckily, he didn't go through with it and just settled on a handshake. He told me not to go after his uncle and wanted to really settle. I agreed since this is a small island and you would meet the same people all the time. I went home after that as I had enough for the night and that incident shook the alcohol out of me and sobered me up. And I still saw that guy and his knife-wielding uncle a couple more times when I was out in town, but we just nodded at each other and never had problems with one another ever since. So that's my story of the time I almost got stabbed and probably killed by some random guy's uncle just for butting into their conversation, which was really none of my business in the first place. And that's the reason why I no longer favor going out to drink till you can't think straight. It's better to stick to herbs instead and just chill at home. So this happened last year in Virginia, 
and is also the reason I never backpack alone anymore. I was taking summer courses at the time, and we ended up with a three-day weekend in June, so I thought it was a great time to go explore some of the Virginian wilderness. I did a Google search. I found a state park with a trail that looked nice, and let my roommate and family know the trail I was going to be on. When I got close to the park, I saw a little outdoor shop where people hiking the Appalachian Trail stop. I went to grab a map of the area just in case I got lost. As I was talking to the owner, he mentioned a trail that's not well known, but has a pretty cool waterfall and swimming hole. This piqued my interest, so I had him show me on the map. He took me outside the state park, but he said it was a great place to go. I paid for the map and thanked the owner. I texted my roommate and parents about the new trail, and I parked my car and set off on my adventure. I should note that the waterfall was going to be a side trip from my journey. I was planning three days and two nights. I started on part of the Appalachian Trail, and it was pretty packed with people. Some of them were really fun to talk to. As expected, as I got further and further from the main trails, I saw less and less people. Around early afternoon, three miles from my destination, I noticed it was unnaturally silent. No bugs, not even wind, and I had a feeling of being watched. I shook it off as me overanalyzing the situation. I got to the waterfall, and it wasn't too spectacular, but it was cool to look at. Plus, it had a good sized area to swim in, so naturally, I stripped down to my skivvies and took a dip. It was pretty refreshing. As I was getting my clothes back on, I started whistling to myself. It was chill, Bill, because I had it stuck in my head. That's when I heard something whistle the tune back. I thought it was a bird copying me, so I went back and forth with it, and it repeated whatever I whistled. I thought it was pretty neat. As I was setting up camp, I couldn't shake this feeling that I was being watched again. I'd get goosebumps and my hairs would stand up. As night fell, I built a small fire and lit my jet boil to make dinner. But as I did this, I became hyper aware again that there was no sound, just deafening silence. Some part of my brain was telling me that I'm not safe and that I should leave. I ignored it and crawled into my tent with my flashlight and book. I went to sleep without incident. When I woke up the next morning, my sight was trashed, my camp stool was nowhere to be found, my bag with my food was cut down, and all of its contents were thrown across the site. My first thought was a crafty animal chewed through the rope and got at the bag. But I looked at the rope and it was cut with something very sharp plus none of the food was even touched. I noticed bare footprints all around my campsite. Keep in mind, I'm at least six to eight miles from a road. As I was looking at the mess, I heard a branch snap off in the distance. I turned to look in that direction, but I saw nothing. Then I heard that whistling again, my whistle from yesterday, but it sounded different, more sinister. It made my hair stand on end and this is when I listened to my instincts to get the hell out of there. It sounded like it was a little off in the distance, so I packed up my camp as fast as I could. The whistling got closer as I finished stuffing my tent into my bag. I didn't bother with putting anything away properly. The whistling was incessant and sounded like it was coming from all directions. I got fed up with the whistling and stood up and yelled, Shut up. What do you want? It stopped whistling and it was quiet for a moment. Then it repeated what I said in my voice. It sounded like me, but distorted, kind of like it came from an old TV. After I heard this, I immediately threw my pack on and then ran the direction I came. I heard it moving just behind me, fast switching between the whistle and my voice. It felt like it was toying with me, not coming too close, but not being too far. Eventually it sounded like it got further and further away from me, then it stopped suddenly. When it stopped, I stopped. I turned around, and I wished I didn't, because I heard the most bone-chilling screech ever coming from right next to me. That's when I started running again, 
I didn't look, I only ran. Less than a half mile, I ran into a couple that was also backpacking. They saw the look of terror in my face and asked if that was me that screamed and also asked if I was okay. I told them about what happened and then they decided not to go down where I came from. We moved to a more populated trail in as quickly as we could. As soon as I got back to my car, I drove to one of the park's ranger stations and reported what happened. Since the site was off park grounds, they told me it wasn't in their jurisdiction, but they'll send a ranger to investigate. The ranger station's parking lot runs right up to the woods, and when I was getting into my jeep, I heard the chill build tune coming from the woods just in front of me. I've never driven so fast in my life. When I told my roommate why I was back after one night, all he said was, Bro, I'm never coming camping with you. It was early December in 2005. My brother, Alex, and his wife's fourth child had just started first grade. So with her having full days of school, they had more time to pick up some extra hours and try to get ready for Christmas. All he could find at the time is work with companies where he would drive a work truck to different counties in our state, making deliveries between businesses that weren't worth getting a semi-truck for. After the big snowstorm we had in 99, that trapped us all at home for weeks. None of us liked the idea of him being on the road. He couldn't stand the idea of having nothing under the tree on Christmas. I didn't even want to go with him. When he asked me, I had the worst feeling about it. But the weather channels all said the storm wouldn't last, and I was the only one out of all of us that had a cell phone, so I just couldn't let him go out there alone. If something happened and he froze to death, due to the fact he couldn't call for help, I don't know if I'd be able to live with myself. So, I dropped my kid off at my sister's house, and I told my husband I'd be back in a few days. That was it. That was the start of all of it. A route he'd done a hundred times up to that point. But the weather channel was wrong. By the time we were nearing the Vermont border and all those mountains came up, not a single one of them had a speck of color on them. Everything around us was white. There were points when all we could do was follow the tire tracks on the roads from vehicles in front of us and hope they didn't go off-road for us to follow. We were starting to lose the light by the time we were closing in on Burlington, Vermont, and we figured that would be as good as a place as any to spend the night. I hate cities, but driving those roads in the dark wasn't an option. We only had to travel through the back way to Montpellier, and then it was smooth sailing on the interstate right into Burlington. In the morning, we could reassess our route and then cut through New Hampshire and from there toward the city. I remember we filled up at the gas station and it was so cold that when we brought our coffees to the van, it didn't even burn our mouths to drink it. Nothing but ice out there. But we were sure we could make it to the interstate and then the roads would be clear. So we kept going, even though we felt off about it. We were talking about what we were getting our kids for Christmas and where we'd be getting together to have Christmas dinner that year when we hit the mountain. I said to him, we should turn around and go back. This isn't safe. For a minute, I thought he'd listen, but then he'd shifted the gear on the van and said, go back to what? He was right. We hadn't seen anything since we got our coffees and they were stone cold by then. It was actually okay for a while. We were following another car stuck behind a plow, so safest place to be at that time of night. Or so we thought. The next bit is always a bit hazy for me. We saw the snow plow jerk toward the edge of the mountainside, and we were so afraid of him going through the bars and off the side of the mountain, I didn't even consider what he was jerking it away from, until I heard Alex yell. I was watching the snow plow trying to ride itself and keep itself on the road, and I didn't even have time to look out the windshield to see what he was yelling about before the car in front hit us. When everything stopped moving, my coffee was everywhere. All over me, the windshield, my phone, everything. My chest was on fire and my legs felt like, 
well, like they'd been hit by a car. And I checked my phone first thing, but no good. It was gone. So much for calling for help. The next thing I checked was my brother. His mouth was bleeding and his eyes were closed, but I said his name and shook him. He groaned, so at least I knew he was alive. All I could see in front of us was ice and rock, so I had no idea what the other driver's states were, but I had to get a phone and get help. So I told him to stay put and got out of the car. Of course he didn't listen to me, because he never does. So before I could even register what I was looking at, he was behind me, calling my name and telling me not to leave him. In front of us was this large truck, and flat as a pancake right in front of it was the car in front of us. I couldn't move. They had to be dead. No one could have survived that. But Alex ran the best he could, holding his chest and stumbling around the car and pried open the passenger door to the truck. I finally got out of my daze when he told me to stay away from the truck, and my heart sank. Was everyone dead? Were we the only ones who survived? That's the day I realized that hell wasn't a place. Being all alone on that mountain, surrounded by metal, rocks, freezing cold wind, ice, and dead bodies, with no way to get help and miles away from anyone or anything. That was the worst feeling I've ever experienced. There was another vehicle that wasn't there though. Someone who might be alive. The snowplow was gone, there was a big dent in the guard's rails, and we couldn't see him. So, he left us to get help. What else could we think? No one that's not pure evil could see what we saw and not stay to help unless they knew they needed to get to the police. I was about to mention the snowplow when he finally got the door open, only to find himself up to his ankles in trash. He didn't hesitate though, he was going for the radio. He climbed into the truck where I could see him. I panicked. Even him just being out of sight. I couldn't stand being alone up there. So I ran to the truck, despite knowing what I'd find. But I had to stop before I got to the doorway. It smelled like a brewery mixed with pennies. I knew that smell. Enough alcoholics are in my family to know that smell. Alex cursed and tumbled back out of the truck and I went to help him up, trying to ignore the fresh blood on his clothes and the ever stronger smell of alcohol and blood filling my nose, coming from the now open door. Radio's dead. Thing won't even start, he snarled, gripping his chest again. I started to tell him my thoughts on the plow when we heard a horrible scream that made us both flinch away from the panic behind it. I practically dropped Alex on the ground, racing back around to the front of the truck to the car and inside was a young girl. She was beautiful, brown hair with blonde highlights, a Lilo and Stitch shirt, and the most beautiful blue eyes I'd ever seen that were filled with tears and terror. She was confused and screaming in between words, reaching out to me, and I grabbed her hands. Alex, in a rush to get me away from the scene, crashed into me, and she cried out when my hands were pulled away from hers but I was right back to the window in seconds with her, pushing him off me. We'll get you out, honey, I promise. I turned on Alex as he tucked on me again. He had to have some sort of idea, right? He could get her. One door was already pried open. We could do another. But his eyes were gigantic when he looked at me, and he wouldn't say a word. Coming from a guy who has never shut up since the day he was born. I met his eyes then followed where he led my gaze to, and a fresh set of tears sprung on me all over again. Right underneath the feet of Stitch on her shirt, and the bit of her stomach that was showing with how she was sitting, there was only solid metal. The rest of her couldn't even be seen. She didn't seem to understand what happened to make me react like that, and started panicking when she followed our eyes, realizing what we did. She began panicking all over, begging us to tell her where to find her legs. So I shushed her, holding her hands tight and promising her that she'll be okay, that help was coming and they'd get her out. I don't know how long I stood there. Alex went back to the truck, and in the mostly undamaged back of ours, to see if he could find anything to help fight off the cold while we waited. But there wasn't much. 
He even searched the area and the trash that fell out of the drunk man's truck, but no look there either. I gave her my jacket after we put on every piece of clothing that we brought with us for the trip. She was getting cold though, and her voice was getting weaker and more quiet. It was completely dark by then. All we could see was what the snow led us, and our flashlights that would run out of battery eventually. Alex tried to convince me to get back into our vehicle to get out of the wind, but I just couldn't leave her. When I looked into her eyes, all I could see was my child when they got to that age one day. She wasn't even 20 yet, trying to get home for Christmas. She told me about her family, about college and her life up until that point, and her asshole boyfriend that was supposed to come with her, but cancelled at the last minute to spend the holidays with his friends instead. She decided before the end that it was a good thing though. She said he was a good man and he didn't deserve to die like this too. She was much more calm by this point, not even acknowledging the fact that she was practically in half. I think deep down, she knew she wasn't going home and needed someone to listen to her as she tried to make sense of how this could be the end of her life. She kept mentioning how cold it was getting, but as soon as Alex noticed me removing layers of clothing to give to her, he scolded me, demanding that I keep as bundled up as possible. He told me that she was already dead, and we're the ones who needed the warmth, not her. I knew he was right, but I cursed him anyway, and I shoved him away from her. Even if she also knew he was right, he didn't need to say that in front of her. She had even grown quiet after some time, us giving each other assurances that everything would be okay, instead of the conversation before. By that time, I was struggling against the cold, even with Alex hugging me trying to keep the wind on his back and off from me when we heard the sirens in the distance. My brother and I looked at each other without even saying anything or showing any emotion. He staggered and limped as fast as he could towards them, holding the flashlight over his head and waving it. He couldn't yell without devolving into coughs and spitting up more blood, gritting his teeth against the pain. And on his chest, he waved the light all over the road towards the sirens. Eventually seeing the lights from the police, firefighters, and ambulances, I told her that they were coming, that they'd help her, and this was all over. But she didn't react. She gave me a sad smile, and it broke my heart into a million pieces. I knew that she knew by then she wasn't going to make it, but seeing the acceptance, mixed in with the fear on her face, and how thankful she was that I was with her, and how lucky my daughter was to have me in her life, was more than I could take. I let go of her hand and did what my brother couldn't. I stood and jumped, waving the flashlight over my head, screaming that we needed the ambulance over here, that she needs help. They heard and rushed over as fast as they could, but Alex was right. There was no helping her. She got to call her mother on one of the EMT's phones and tell her she loved her, along with some other messages to her family and they moved her to try to get her out. And that was it. They took me away into the ambulance after they ensured her pulse had stopped. She was dead. The drunk guy was dead. My brother could be dying for all I knew, and none of it felt real. My brother and I were allowed to ride in the ambulance together. It was against protocol, but given what we just went through and how devastated I was, they allowed it. I think Alex would have attacked them if they tried to separate me from him at that point. Regardless, he wasn't letting me out of his sight until we were in a building with heat and off that fucking mountain. Once we got to the hospital, they took him away, and I was alone. I called my husband, told him where I was and the gist of what happened. Then I called my aunt, told her even less of what happened, and that I would call her the second I heard anything about Alex and I had to wake my kid up because I had to hear the voice. Now, it's 2021, and when it's cold outside, my skin burns as if it's being stabbed by heated needles. Alex had so much blood in his lung by the time that they came that he still has problems with breathing. We both had broken ribs that healed, and the surgery I had to get later on my legs went fine. It's 2021, and we're alive. We got to come home and have Christmas, and all the Christmases since then. I saw my child grow up to be the age of that poor girl, and then surpass her. I never went to her funeral, 
or met with her family. I've always regretted that. These days, I don't even remember her voice, her family's names. I don't remember what school she went to, or where exactly her boyfriend went for Christmas instead of going home with her. I don't remember how her hands felt, or the smell of her shampoo in her hair. Hell, most of the time, it doesn't even feel like she was a real person. Like it was a horrible dream, or something that happened to someone else. But she gave me that smile at the end. Now she knew it was over, but was too scared to actually say it. Now one of her last acts was to reassure me that she knew that she was going to die and that it was going to be all okay, just like we said it. That I will never forget.